Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Urban Future Summer Workshop. I'm Kristen Lauder, and on behalf of the organizers, I want to thank you all for joining us for the next three days of an intensive working event, including talks and working groups. The world is changing fast, and cities are facing many challenges, from COVID and public health challenges to air quality and environmental impact, to economic and social equity and community engagement issues. Our agenda includes working groups focused on all of these topics, in which we hope to create research and collaboration plans and outline opportunities for concrete impact in cities in practice. I'm lucky to be the research manager for our new Urban Innovation Initiative at Microsoft Research, and I'd like to thank the team, Scott Counts, Asta Roseway, Paul Johns, and Gavin Janka, and his central engineering team for all their hard work to make this conference happen. We're lucky to be partnering with Roy Zimmerman and Janus Safabian and Kenji Takeda from Microsoft Research Outreach Team to run this virtual event. And we're especially indebted to Janus and Kylie and the technical support team for putting all the pieces together to make it happen virtually. We've had significant support for our work and this conference from our Corporate and Legal Affairs Division under Brad Smith. And I want to especially thank Michael Matt Miller for his help in organizing. We organized this event together and have been learning as we go, having fun. Hopefully some future event will happen in person, but for now we'll have to do what we can in this virtual setting. Over the next three days, we'll hear short talks from leading scientists and researchers representing universities, institutes, and cities. We have more than 100 attendees joining us and leading experts in many fields. You'll also hear from several relevant teams from Microsoft, including our Urban Innovation Initiative in research, as well as our Smart Energy and Places team in Azure, which is our cloud product division, as well as from our AI for Earth and state and local government teams in CELA. Microsoft has recently announced its commitment to be carbon negative by 2030, in addition to a $1 billion climate innovation fund. We hope to learn from each other and look for ways to build strong research collaborations across all sectors, which can accelerate the impact we envision. So after starting each day with recorded talks, which will be publicly available after the workshop, we're using an innovative collaboration format for the second half of each day. Everyone has been assigned to a working group and you should have heard from your group leaders by now. These working groups are intended to be a fun way to do community building, share ideas, and identify opportunities for collaboration and shared agendas and coordination for impact. To keep the groups focused and to create some tangible outcomes from the workshop, each group will be writing a short white paper over the course of three days. The white papers will be made publicly available and will be public domain, no IP ownership with all authors listed and equal to the members of your group who participate and wish to be listed. These are brainstorming sessions and the idea is to have a scribe for each group and capture the thoughts of the group real time to minimize post-processing. I'll say a little bit more about suggestions for your uh, focused group work at the end of the talks today. So for now, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us, and I'll turn it over to Roy Zimmerman, who will make a few more logistical announcements and lead us through the program for today. Thank you. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. I just have a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, just a reminder that we're recording and we'll share the recordings after the sessions. Uh, we do have a few speakers who have asked not to have their talks published, and we will absolutely accommodate that. Please bear with us as we continue to refine our own virtual experience platform for this event. We may experience a few hiccups, like people forgetting to unmute themselves, and I thank you in advance for your patience. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties during the event, please email Janus by replying to any of the emails you receive from MSR events, and she will work with you on troubleshooting. Our team will make sure you are muted during the talks. That's not because we don't wanna hear from you. All questions should be submitted through the chat tool. You can submit these at any time during the talks. All speakers will be invited to answer any questions not addressed during the session after the event. Feel free to use the hashtag Urban Futures WKSHP workshop if you want to amplify the event on your own social media channels. And I will publish that to the group uh, right now. Hopefully you can see that in the chat window. And uh, with that, we'll move on to our first speaker, who is Scott Counts from Microsoft. He'll be talking about city futures and the urban innovation 
at Microsoft. Terrific, thank you, Roy, and hello, everybody. Uh, very excited for this workshop. Uh, like Roy said, I'm Scott Counts. I'm a senior principal researcher in the Redmond Lab of Microsoft Research. I've got just 20 minutes or so today. I want to make sure to leave time for questions, so I'm going to give a fairly brief overview of urban innovation at Microsoft Research, and then also touch on some of the, uh, so that includes things like our charter, uh, uh, some of our projects, examples from our projects, some of our guiding principles, uh, and then shift gears a little bit and talk about some of the opportunities uh, in this urban science and technology space at Microsoft, uh, the company more broadly. Um, and so that includes things like data opportunities, compute opportunities, and then some of the big picture initiatives that Kristen just mentioned uh, that Microsoft has launched. So before I get into any of that, though, let me start by saying who we are. Uh, so who who are the uh, folks involved with the Urban Innovation Initiative at Microsoft Research? So this is the uh, team of people who have come together really quite organically to work in this space. Um, and I don't have time to introduce everybody, uh, but you will hear talks from Gavin Jenke tomorrow and Asta Roseway the following day. And just about everybody here is involved in participating in the workshop. Uh, so please feel free to reach out. Um, I will say this is just a, an incredibly multidisciplinary uh, group of folks. Uh, we have backgrounds and everything from electrical engineering to hardware design, chemistry, industrial engineering, social science, computer science, uh, user experience and design. Um, so I, I do think actually that breadth has uh, been quite fun uh, and also served us quite well uh, as we uh, engage with cities, which as we all know are very complex, very multifaceted entities. So those are just the full-time folks. We're also extremely fortunate this summer to have an amazing group of interns working with us, um, also uh, bringing a very uh, multidisciplinary set of skills uh, so we have people coming from uh, atmospheric chemistry, from various parts of computer science, from AI and ML to uh, human computer interaction, also human development and family science. Uh, so extremely uh, fun group of interns this summer. And the interns will be giving uh, lightning talks on their summer projects, two per day uh, later on in, in each day. So please look for those. OK, so turning to uh, our urban innovation initiative at Microsoft Research, um, I want to give an overview of kind of our charter or areas of focus. We break our research uh, projects down into three areas. So the first one is uh, the economic or environmental impact of urbanization. And there you see a screenshot of our uh, air quality sensor, which I know a bunch of you are familiar with. Um, but we also have other project in this environmental impact space, um, in particular uh, lines of research looking at next generation sensing technologies um, on this kind of march toward, you know, low, ultra low or even no power sensing technologies. Um, in the economic development space, um, kind of a third or second area there, uh, we have mostly these are data analytics projects and I'm actually going to give a couple examples in a few slides of, of those. Um, and then our third area is uh, we call community, and this is a bit of a catch-all category, but it includes projects in areas like public health, social equity. In fact, we have a great summer project with an intern in the social equity space uh, looking at uh, disparities in employment rebound, hope hopefully rebound uh, from the unemployment shock uh, due to COVID. Now, Project Eclipse, which is our air quality sensing project, um, is our kind of big project, our marquee project. And it's been a great one for us because it really does touch on all three of these areas of focus. So let me use that to illustrate um, some of our sort of guiding principles for how we're going about doing research in this space. So the first one is about really kind of democratizing data. And so when we think about um, air quality sensing and doing this, what we're calling hyper-local air quality sensing, one of the phrases we use is democratizing air quality sensing or data. And what do we mean by that? Well, what we mean is that 
air quality uh, sensing and data should be available and um, useful and reliable for everybody. And so how do you enable that? And that's one of the big challenges that we've been going after. And so one of the ways that you do that is uh, by having lots of sensors. Uh, if you want it to be hyper local, you have to have lots of sensors. So how do you enable that? Well, one thing is you try and bring down the cost of the devices themselves. And so we've been working hard on that. Um, and then the other way really is that, you know, we're trying to make this thing very dead simple to use. And so we have this metaphor of the zip tie. Uh, this air quality sensor should be zip tie easy to use. And it's not just a metaffor actually. Uh, we in fact have an affordance on the back of the device to just zip tie uh, one of these devices anywhere really, but a, a street light, a bus shelter, um, and there's no um, power required, it's battery power, there's a cellular connection. And so literally within minutes of hanging one of these devices, you have data going right up into a cloud store. So what we hope that enables really is a kind of a full sensors to analytics solution. And so we're really, and what you see there is a, a picture of the device on the left and then data in a Power BI visualization on the right. And so really in the end, it's all about the data and making the data available to relevant uh, community members and constituents. And so we have a number of ways for accessing data once they're in the cloud store through an API, through Power BI as you're seeing there. Uh, we've partnered with uh, cities to make uh, data live in Excel. There's map visualizations for, for mobile devices. And so really the, the goal here is to make this, this full all the way through the data and analytics solution. And then as we do that, uh, we're you know, wanting to get out and, and deploy in the real world, uh, test in the real world. And we've done a few deployments now. So we started in Boston last fall in a pilot deployment. You see some pictures there. Uh, and I know some of you attending were involved with that. So thank you for your collaboration. Um, and that ran for a few months. We're now currently deployed with this project in Kenmore, Washington, which is near Seattle or part of the Seattle Metro. Also in Miami, uh, have our initial deployment there. Now Tacoma, Washington has been uh, just a terrific partner for us. Unfortunately, our deployment there got disrupted due to COVID, um, but so that's kind of in TBD status. And then as we go um, through these different deployments, we're really trying to scale up um, just to, in terms of number of devices out in the communities. And so we're penciling in a, a Chicago deployment. Again, I know some of you are involved with that project um, for this fall. And so we're really looking forward to kind of the next wave of deployments this fall. And ultimately, when we're doing these deployments, you know, we're really trying to listen to community members, uh, city leaders, civic tech group folks to understand what are the important policy and resource allocation questions that we can answer with this technology. So what you're seeing there is a bullet point list of actual uh, project titles that we have collaboratively authored with our some of our city partners um, and local civic tech groups uh, in Miami, in Kenmore, in Tacoma, and so forth. Um, and I've just kind of categorized them a little bit, but you know, so there's a bunch of urban renewal related projects, so lots of greenification projects, uh, development, so sort of monitoring, um, you know, commercial and, and housing developments in urban areas. Lots of focus on social equity related questions. So the map you're seeing there is actually of Tacoma, uh, Washington, and the color coding uh, corresponds to a neighborhood level equity index that city of Tacoma has put together where equity refers to a, a, a kind of a constellation of factors like access to good food sources, access to transportation, housing prices, and so forth. And the plan, uh, which although I mentioned got disrupted due to COVID, but uh, the plan at some point is to put our air quality sensors in these different neighborhoods based on this equity index and to see how air quality correlates uh, with um, these, this equity index from city of Tacoma. 
Um, and then, of course, lots of mobility related uh, project ideas as well. So that was just a couple of slides, uh, fairly high level, really, about Project Eclipse. Again, our air quality sensing project that I know some of you are familiar with. Uh, tomorrow, Gavin Jenke will be talking about the hardware, the sensing device itself. Uh, and then Thursday, Asta Roseway will be talking about uh, ways to engage uh, community members and other stakeholders with the air quality data. So I'm going to uh, shift gears a little bit here and talk about some of our other projects that leverage a really a, a pretty unique data source, which is search query data from Bing. So search query data are really just an amazing uh, data set. Uh, for starters, as you can imagine, people search for just about everything under the sun uh, and then some. Um, but but from, a, from a social scientific perspective, um, you have really uh, some incredible sampling properties. So the coverage is just terrific. I mean, Bing, uh, Bing doesn't have as much usage as Google, uh, of course, but it does have really significant usage, particularly in the US. So for desktop web searching, uh, Bing power is actually a third of all queries in the US. So the sampling properties are just terrific. And, you know, I think from a, from a modeling and forecasting perspective, search queries are what we think about or sometimes called aspirational that is they're forward looking so people are looking for information about a decision uh, that or, or behavior that they're going to take in the future and um, so that has really nice properties from a forecasting standpoint um, and at this point working with bing queries uh, we have a really nice process in place for um, you know in utilizing the data in a privacy friendly irb approved uh, manner uh, where everything's anonymized and aggregated and we even have a track record now of sharing extracted signals with research partners outside of Microsoft. So let me jump into these projects. Uh, so the first one is in the economic space and this is about measuring demand for employment. In other words, people searching for jobs. Um, and so what we've done here is take search queries, identify those queries that are job searches, and then from those, we classify them into different employment categories. Uh, so uh, these are things like technology, leisure and hospitality, retail, uh, art, uh, architecture and engineering and so forth. So these different employment sectors. And then what you're seeing on the left there is the scatter plot on the left. Uh, on the x-axis, we have a uh, population of count U.S. counties, so every dot is U.S. county. And on the right, is, or sorry, on the y-axis is the diversity across those different employment sectors of the job searches. So in short, this is a way to relate the diversity of job searching to, in this case, population of U.S. counties. And so what you see there is that as population increases, uh, job search diversity also increases. So lower is actually more diverse on the Gini coefficient scale there um, until you hit about 50,000 people. And when you hit population of 50,000, um, of course, that's not causal, it's correlational, but uh, the uh, diversity of job searching tends to sort of level out, if you will. So this is a metric and how might you use this job search diversity metric? Well, I mean, a number of ways really. So for instance, if you're a smaller municipality who's growing, uh, you're hoping that you're growing economically in a way that's robust and diverse. And so this would be one way to track that. Um, or if, let's say from a larger metropolitan area standpoint, um, you know, you're making transportation decisions and you're thinking about what's our, you know, how should we connect to some of the growing outlying areas in a way that helps them most increase economic or employment diversity. Um, or even just related to coming out of COVID, uh, you know, this is a way to see if as we hopefully anyway uh, rebound economically that people are searching for jobs um, in a way again that's diverse and robust. Now, the map on the right, uh, that's a screenshot from a tool that we built. You know, there's the URL there. You can go and click around and play with some of these data. Um, and so what that interactive web experience shows is, again, county scale 
and we um, allow we show how again how these job search uh, metrics correspond to different population demographics. So in this case, the green and the red are highlighting um, education level, so high and low education counties in the US, and then looking at the percent of searches that are in the leisure and hospitality industry. So for instance, you see in Nevada, um, a number of counties that are lower uh, in education, but high in terms of leisure and hospitality job searches. So please feel free to play around with that. Um, Another example using query data, um, this one connects to our air quality sensing project. Um, so for this one, we were trying to model respiratory illness rates at quite fine geographic scales. So this is a census tract uh, scale, approximately neighborhood scale. Uh, this is Chicago, by the way. I know we have a big Chicago contingent, but for the rest of us, that's Chicago. Um, and so here on the left, we see kind of our ground truth, which is estimates from CDC about asthma rates um, and the different census tracts in Chicago. The middle uh, image there shows um, what we did using just query data alone. And then on the right, we see our, our kind of overall best model, uh, which combines being query data with other data sources, such as land cover data from satellite, uh, from satellites, and census data. And the best model actually correlates with the CDC um, at over 0 0.9, 0 0.92 or so. And that's across you know, literally tens of thousands of census tracts and hundreds of cities around the country. And then the final example I'll give of ways to leverage this data source. Um, we have another one um, on this uh, interactive website if you want to go have a look. This one's about forecasting migration, human migration. Uh, in the United States. And so what we're seeing here on the left is just from ACS. So this is just uh, net migration as a percent of state population. And then the map on the right is based on our data where um, we can uh, estimate the inflow and outflow, but also in terms of whether the intent to move is based on a housing related query or a, an employment related query. And you can even go deeper than that. So if it's a employment related query, what type of employment are people looking for? So there's effectively a graph, which in this case is state to state, 50 by 50 graph, uh, where the edges are uh, intents to migrate and then what type of intent. And the map here shows the state to state uh, graph, uh, but we also have uh, county to county and metro to metro graphs available as well. So those were a few more of our projects and, and some examples leveraging the uh, query data from Bing, uh, but there are other outside of Microsoft Research, but just broader Microsoft, other data and compute related resources that we all might take advantage of. So let me mention a few of those. So the first one is AI for Earth. Um, which I uh, put the URL there for you to learn more uh, if, you, if you don't know already. Uh, but AI for Earth it, um, offers uh, data sets, offers compute grants and other grants uh, for people working on in the environmental and climate science space. Um, so definitely look there for, for resources. And we'll have uh, Lucas Joppa uh, speaking on Thursday uh, from AI for Earth. The second one is open data sets from Azure itself. So um, we've worked with Azure on a few different, different projects related to urban science and technology. Uh, one was on uh, creating a, a heat island uh, index uh, for every city in the US based on a decade's worth of NOAA weather data that they're hosting in an open format. Um, another one was looking at cross city comparisons of 311 data based on data that they're hosting um, and I think really the advantage here is the availability of the data, but also it's put in just a very high performance uh, environment. So it's very quick to compute with. Um, and then the third one I'll mention is in the economic space, and this is from LinkedIn. So if you work in the economic uh, kind of modeling space, you probably read LinkedIn's monthly workforce reports. Um, they're also offering uh, workforce related data now. So another resource to check out in the broader Microsoft scope. 
Microsoft, of course, also uh, makes technology products, uh, a number of which are very relevant to urban science and technology. So let me touch on a few of those. Um, for sure, for environmental uh, and urban sensing work, um, as Kristen alluded to, the Azure IoT folks have been just a terrific partner for us. Um, and Miriam Rassom will be speaking um, tomorrow uh, and is also participating in the workshop. She uh, works uh, on the smart city side of the Azure IoT team. And again, just terrific uh, collaboration uh, partner for us. Um, in the economic area, I mentioned earlier that we had done this project uh, working with Bing search query data around job searching. Well, we had actually a, a kind of a partner, a sister project where we looked at skill development using search queries. And so what we've done now with the uh, folks at Bing that run the job search results is we have built a statistical model derived from the queries themselves that learn associations between skills and jobs that then enables um, us to identify jobs that leverage similar skills. And so we're now thinking of ways to surface that in the Bing job search results. And so what you're seeing there, this isn't live yet, but this is a kind of an early mock-up of what that could look like. So when somebody searches for cashier jobs, uh, we can start to surface other similar jobs, uh, teller, associate, stalker in this case. Um, and so the goal, and I think this will be especially relevant as people, um, you know, kind of return to work after COVID, um, which is we can help people, you know, sort of cast a wider net, if you will, in their job search. Hey, Scott, um, Scott. Yeah. We are nearly out of time and we've got a lot of questions for you. So <laughs> I'd like to at least be okay. able to get to one of the questions yeah, uh, so that sure. we can model some best practices here uh, or, okay, or nearly sure. best practices. Sure. Um, uh, those of you who ask questions, uh, I'm sure Scott will be able to follow up with you individually uh, and we'll figure out a way to try and share those if possible. The first question we came in that came in was from Danielle Aliaga from Purdue. Uh, I'll see if we can combine them so that you can answer both. Does the air quality sensor gather temperature and humidity? And is this related to the Chicago AOT project? Uh, the answer is yes and mostly yes, uh, so and hopefully yes. So for the first one, yes, it does do temperature and humidity. And like I said, Gavin Jenke tomorrow will go into a fair amount of detail about the device itself, but it picks up four gases, uh, particulate matter, and then temperature and humidity. And yes, we are partnering with the AOT folks in Chicago. So our Chicago deployment um, will basically be kind of a coming together of, of our project in AOT. Great. Thank you, Scott. Uh, and thank you for the very interesting, thorough, comprehensive talk uh, and for uh, allowing a little bit of time at the end there for a question. Uh, just a reminder to the rest of our speakers um, to be mindful of the time so that we can try and keep this uh, as interactive as possible with our um, other participants. Um, and clearly, everyone's got a lot of really great information to share. So um, thank you for, for the, all of that, Scott. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Paul Hodgson. Uh, who manages city data at the Greater London Authority. He'll be talking to us about London's digital twin for air quality and COVID-19 response. Paul, the microphone is yours. Hi, thank you very much. Um, so I, I work for the Greater London Authority. We're the strategic authority for the capital and I'm part of an intelligence and research team. So I manage um, data scientists, data engineers, developers, and also the GIS mapping folk. Um, and we've been interested in business for a while. Um, originally, it was about understanding the public realm. So there are about 40 major redevelopment um, neighbourhoods in, in London um, with kind of large new public space being created. And we wanted to understand how existing public spaces, um, town squares and so on are being used to help us design the new ones as, as well as we could. But then um, we started um, looking in more detail, detail about air quality and um, the pollution tends to kind of follow people around the city across the day. So um, domestic boilers first thing in the morning where people are having showers and have the heating, then connected to travel um, during the rush hour and then connected to um, office space and um, factories during the, the kind of the peak of the day. 
So we started looking at novel ways of kind of trying to track that, not quite in real time, but but in closer to, to real time. Um, and then, of course, COVID came along and we've been trying to understand busyness uh, in relation to that. So I'll talk you through, I guess, um, how we've um, taken our existing air quality project, um, which has been running with the Alan Turing Institute for a couple of years, uh, and then really use that foundation to help us in our, our COVID-19 response. So air quality um, in London, come the, um, the causes of poor air quality or causes of pollution come from quite a wide range of sources. So um, this is an estimate of the percentage um, of the different, um, I guess, contributors uh, in a typical year. And you can see they're all spread right across fairly low percentages. So there's no one silver bullet where you can kind of tackle that particular cause and, and then kind of fix all of the problems. So we've had a number of um, programmes. So in London, we're looking to replace the buses with electric buses. Uh, we've got a low emission zone in the very centre of London where um, we're trying to reduce the kind of number of diesel cars. Um, we're putting green walls in front of primary schools where they're next to busy roads. We're working with local authorities to reconfigure high streets to make them more pedestrian friendly. So there's, there's lots of interventions going on, pretty much matched against nearly all of these kind of squares on the on, the original, on this chart. Um, and we've been modelling air quality for, for quite some time. So we've got a, a reasonable network of 70 really high quality um, kind of scientific instruments essentially. And then we take the annual average traffic flows um, from our transport authority. So for every single road in London, we've got an indication of the annual kind of number of cars and, and kind of other vehicles on those roads. And then we run a, a quite a traditional kind of mechanistic model, but we've got an advanced model um, that allows us to get a, a fairly good estimate of air quality right down to kind of a, a 20 meter grid. The issue is that the, the data sources that flow into that and also the modeling often mean that we're two to three years um, behind. Um, so, so we've just current recently um, published 2016 data. Um, and the air quality modeling from that time has been really helpful in helping us design our interventions as a city authority. But um, what we really needed was um, a much kind of higher turnover of um, estimates and kind of air quality modeling to help us understand how effective our interventions have been. So the um, which bus routes should we prioritize um, having the electric vehicles on and then kind of very quickly understand well what's the impact that, that they've had as an example. And uh, a couple of years ago, we were very fortunate to have the opportunity to work with the Alan Turing Institute. So in the UK, that is the um, National Data Science Centre of Excellence. And really their role is to take, um, I guess, kind of cutting edge um, leading research work and then apply it in um, real world situations. So it kind of matched up their requirements very well. And one of the things they've been helping us with is access a broader range of inputs. Um, so whereas beforehand we relied very much just on a single type of air sensor, um, so I guess kind of linking into perhaps some of Scott's work um, in the previous kind of talk, um, mid-range and lower range kind of air quality sensors, there are now hundreds of them across London, um, and I think fairly soon there'll be thousands. Um, we're also able to make use of satellite data, so a lot of London's pollution doesn't actually come from London. Uh, it blows in from industrial uh, mainland Europe or maybe sand blowing up from the Sahara. And you, it's very difficult for a probabilistic model to um, uh, take that into account. But you can actually track it coming across the UK kind of towards London the day before. And so you can bring it into your, your kind of following day's models. And then finally, of course, there have been um, a huge explosion in individuals using um, apps um, for, for navigation and we can take the feeds uh, from Waze and TomTom and some of those other kind of um, devices and get a feel for kind of where there's congestion um, or kind of unexpected kind of congestion. And then what the Turing team have done is bring that together in a probabilistic modeling approach um, and 
what they've been able to do for us is allow us to combine data of very different resolutions from different, very different sources. Um, so like satellite data, I mean, I think one pixel from that is, is perhaps a kilometre across, whereas the air quality sensors uh, are taking lots and lots of readings, but just at a very, very local level. So you've got these very different types of data and they've brought them together into kind of a single unified model, uh, used machine learning so that they can run a model every night, make a prediction and then look at well, what actually happened the next day and refine and kind of tweak their, their model. Um, and also really importantly, and present that as, as an open API. And what that will do is look a bit more like the weather forecast. So 48 hours ahead, one hour intervals, it gives an indication of um, what the pollution levels will be. And that's incredibly useful for us as a city authority, but it will also hopefully enable public decision making as well. So you could imagine someone planning a route, perhaps they cycle to work, perhaps they're visiting a park, perhaps they're meeting up with friends and they would normally take a certain route, but they can overlay their um, journey planner with um, air quality forecasts and perhaps either travel at a different time to avoid a, a peak or to um, take a slight detour to avoid a particular incident. Um, so it allows people to make decisions um, to avoid pollution as well as the city authority to actually reduce the levels of pollution itself. Now, of course, um, the big priority um, for London, as it is for an awful lot of cities and uh, most um, areas, is how do we respond um, to the crisis and how do we then move into kind of recovery um, over the coming months? And what we were able to do is to um, access a broader range of um, input data sources. So, so in, in addition to all the work that had already been going on for the air quality modelling, um, including road sensors, CCTV and so on, um, we've been looking at kind of novel data sources for us as a city authority, so um, aggregated, anonymised mobile phone um, trip counts, um, card spend, uh, and also polling to understand, um, I guess, attitudes and how attitudes change across across the week. And, and to match that, the, the Turing team um, bid for some internal resources and essentially um, tripled the size of the team for a period of two to three months to do a really focused, concentrated piece of work, um, making the best use of these additional sources, and I guess the kind of the wider brief. Um, and there's three main um, kind of uses of this. So our public health um, planners, if they relied solely on health data, they'd always be about three or four weeks behind changes in behavior. So if you get an uh, an increase in um, unsafe behaviour, then you get an increase in cases, but, but that can take maybe kind of a couple of weeks for people to see the symptoms, then maybe a week to be hospitalised if they're unfortunate, a little while for the tests to come back, so, so there's always that kind of sort of time lag. And the public health people challenged us to say, well, well can you come up with any kind of early warning system that, that cuts down on that, that time at all? Um, and then the priority at the moment, certainly in London and a lot of other cities in the UK, is to try and reopen high streets safely. So there's this idea of kind of um, good busyness or a safe level of busyness. So you need to have a certain amount of footfall to make it um, worthwhile for the shops to open so they're economically viable. But you don't want too much footfall so that people aren't able to socially distance anymore. So it's a really fine balance to try and strike. Um, and uh, certainly in the UK, there's been lots of temporary measures where pavements have been widened, um, roads have been blocked off, um, new cycleways have been created. And what we're trying to do is build up an evidence base to help the people who manage town centres, who manage high streets, manage business improvement districts, um, to understand, well, have the existing arrangements made enough extra space? Is more extra space perhaps needed? or maybe the extra space isn't all needed, so you can begin to give some space back to the traffic. Um, or perhaps there are whole areas of the borough that, that are busier than expected and need these kind of temporary arrangements. So that's a real focus across the summer as we begin to try and get um, the economy going again and get people out um, visiting their, their local kind of neighbourhoods. And in the longer term, what we're hoping is, is this kind of business work will help us understand 
perhaps as whole sectors of the economy or whole neighbourhoods, whole areas of, of the capital that haven't um, returned to how they were and need to reinvent themselves um, and need to adapt. And so to understand, well, which ones are those? What what kind of support they need? So there's kind of three, I guess, kind of timescales we're working on. So the very short one for the public health people, the practical support for the high street managers and then the longer term economic recovery work. And in terms of outputs, what we're looking towards is um, trying to understand how each area is against normal. So that would be we're taking that to be kind of a rolling 12 months period. Um, previous um, to take into account the seasonal effects in certain areas. So this is kind of pre-COVID figures. How, how does today compare to, to that? But also comparing to lockdown normal. So, so when we had lockdown, pretty much everyone who could stay at home was staying at home. So that is the absolute minimum level of activity that you're ever likely to see. Um, so what we can do is kind of benchmark that and see, well, how has it changed week on week since that very kind of um, early lockdown? And then the final thing is that, you know, if you've got loads and loads of sensors taking lots and lots of readings constantly um, day after day, hour after hour, um, you end up just completely drowning in, in the data if you're not careful. So, so actually what you want to do is to be able to flag um, what's important to you. So one of the things the Turing team have been doing is kind of building in that um, warning kind of systems as well. And um, in terms of geography, we're, we're doing some um, time tracking work um, at a whole city level. Um, and there's lots and lots of different data sources, um, some of them are quite noisy. So what we're trying to do is kind of understand well, what are the trends like uh, against different types of metrics. But then we're beginning to dig in now um, with the benefit of mobile phone data into borough level. So London has 33 boroughs and you can see that um, certain boroughs have uh, bounced back in terms of act certain types of activities to kind of February figures, where others have, have stayed, you know, perhaps only 30% or, or less of um, those kind of levels. And then finally, um, for people responsible for those kind of very local responses, we need to try and get data right down to the high street or, or the kind of the town centre level. Um, and that's what we're kind of looking to do with the our very kind of localised data. So like um, I guess kind of most digital projects, there's kind of different stages to this. So um, we've been working a lot on trying to identify the different types of input data. So assessing them for suitability and cost and um, I guess consistency because um, we're looking for kind of time series. Um, we've been doing a lot of work building the infrastructure to, to deal with kind of um, ingesting all this data. Um, and then the, I guess the really interesting stuff is the modelling. So kind of making sense of that data. Um, so what what's it tell us? And um, that's one of the areas that the Turing have been leading on. And then what we've been leading on as the city authority is identifying groups of end users, bringing them together into kind of data sharing um, groups so that we can really understand what is what are the key questions that you need to answer um, and really drilling down into in the details so we can design products that um, do kind of one thing but do one thing well and really help them on a, a practical day-to-day -day basis. Um, and in terms of the split between the different organisations, um, as the GLA, it's probably fair to say we're working with smaller data um, and more kind of traditional kind of GIS kind of um, best fit between kind of different types of geographies. Uh, and the Turing have been leading on the, the big data pipelines and processing really kind of quite large kind of flows of, of data. And we've been very fortunate, uh, Microsoft support Turing um, through Azure credits uh, and have also provided some really practical advice in um, setting up a, a robust and kind of, um, uh, I guess, kind of industrial kind of quality API uh, to support access to, to these kind of data flows. So just to give you a couple of examples, there's um, a couple of sub teams at the Turing and one's working on image recognition. So edge detection has obviously been around for a while and they've been using that to kind of tag um, traffic cameras so or images from traffic cameras. So you can spot this is a bus, this is a car, this is a cyclist, this is a pedestrian um, and not facial recognition, but just recognizing humanoids. 
And then what you can do is take these kind of dumb video feeds, turn those into counts. So they're building up time series um, based on regular samples of kind of counts of different um, types of things that are passing the cameras. And then they can also overlay um, a spatial grid. So for people, you can work out how many people are on a pavement um, at certain times and then kind of how far away they are from um, one another and therefore social distancing. And the figure on the right is like a heat map, I guess, of pedestrians up and down that high street. And on the right hand side, there are a lot more than than on the left hand side. Um, so you can tell from the lighter colours. And then the other really helpful thing they've been doing is um, modelling normal for each location. Um, and what that allows you to do is to then flag up the things that are unexpected for that location and that time. And the um, little um, chart on the right, the, the red areas are areas, clusters of unusual activity, either in space or in the, um, the third dimension, the height is, is time. So um, you can begin to, I guess, kind of one off little peaks you're not interested in, but, but where something um, significant is happening, that, that's where you want to kind of draw your attention to. And then the final bit of work is um, on routing. So um, back on the, the air quality project, what they were looking at is kind of, could you as someone going out for a walk, someone going out for a run, someone going for a cycle, could as well as um, you putting in your start and your destination, um, could you also design um, circular routes that avoid, that minimize your um, uh, exposure to high pollution areas? And that's a trickier task than you think. I, I think the first time they ran it, basically the route went straight to a, a clean area, then ran backwards and forwards up the same road about 20 times and then went home again, which isn't a particularly interesting run. So they, they've done a lot of work on, on turning it into, I guess, kind of a compromise between the lowest um, pollution, but, but also an interesting kind of route in its own right. And if you change the pollution levels, then the actual route changes as well. Um, and then what they've done is, is their, the final step is to take the outputs of some of the modelling um, and help people, um, I guess, kind of route themselves to the least busy bits of London. So there's some basic input information here. The, um, the orange areas and the red areas are narrow pavements. So kind of focus you towards the blue pavements, but also towards busier or quieter kind of times of the day. So perhaps if you've got respiratory illness or you're living with someone who's shielding, you can then, um, but you do have to go out um, for whatever reason. It can, you can help um, identify the kind of the best routes and the best times to take. So this is what it kind of looks like brought together. Um, so it's going to be a mix of open data, shared data, and small amounts of paid for data. And really there's three main outputs. So there's the London level time series, and then there's network busyness. So busyness on the roads, busyness on the um, pavements and so on. And then destination busyness, so busyness at the um, town centres and the high streets. And in terms of open data coming out um, on the data store, we'll be posting commentary and blogs and obviously data visualisation. But the main outputs will be shared data. Because there's shared data and paid for data going into it, we can't make all of the final outputs open data, even though we'd like to. So we'll be creating interactive tools governed by data sharing agreements with our users in business improvement districts and, and high streets and so on. So just to finish off, these are our kind of key research questions that we're working on. So I've talked quite a lot about the town centres and the high street. Um, we're also interested in understanding um, the extent to which visitors are returning to London. So London's economy obviously relies a lot on its residents, but we also benefit from many millions of visitors in a, a typical year. There's a field that local high streets are actually doing reasonably well, um, but the office districts um, right in the centre of London um, haven't really returned to anything like normal levels. And then finally, um, we want to identify um, vulnerable groups um, and really if there's any kind of spike in busyness or unsafe busyness in the areas where there's a concentration of vulnerable groups to, to really kind of flag that. So I'm going to stop there and um, very happy to answer questions over the next few minutes. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Um, we do have Stop our first sharing. question from yeah. Helen Fitzmorris. 
uh, and it looks like someone else wants to know the answer to this question as well. Um, the question is, do you use the cameras to characterize surface street truck traffic? Uh, yes, so I mean, London, so Transport for London has 900 cameras already, um, which, which essentially if there's a, an accident or a major event, they, they use that to understand what, what's going on on the street. Quite a lot of boroughs are sitting on maybe 100 to, to 800 cameras, um, often in pedestrianised areas, um, more connected with community safety. So we're repurposing these existing networks um, and turning the dumb video feeds into counts. Uh, so kind of real useful data and social distancing data. So that, that's what the project's been about. Uh, but, but absolutely nothing to do with facial recognition or tracking individuals. Uh, and it's been through the Turing Ethics Committee and, and so on. And was it problematic at all working with the city to redirect the the use of those cameras for that purpose at all? So the, the Transport for London cameras were open source data already. Um, ah. So it was a relatively straightforward data sharing agreement with them. Uh, the individual boroughs, they're, they're working their way through. Um, they're not really set up for sharing live video feeds with external organisations. So they're working their way through the logistics of that. So I think there's a lot of willing uh, and they can see the benefit of it. But it, there's a slight time lag while I well, they put in place the systems for sharing those video feeds, I guess. Um, but then obviously having done that, it, yeah, we'll have benefits for months and, and years to come. Got it. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Srabia Avasarala. Uh, the question is, how do you overlay this data with the data from the hospitals to warn people about the potential risks? Mm -hmm. So that wouldn't be our role. We would be making this available this data available to the public health authorities because um, they're the experts um, in modeling the, um, the shape of the curve and, and so on. So that isn't the city's responsibility. It, this is the public health authorities. So, so if, but but they it's our responsibility, I guess, to kind of feed in our best intelligence to them. Right. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, is the city of London working with uh, as unique as your city is? Uh, are you working with any other cities to share data or share best practices or uh, align common goals to learn from each other or uh, benefit from each other's work? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, less so in this kind of very technical kind of machine learning kind of part of the project, but in the wider designing the recovery. We've been doing a review of lots of other cities around the world who've recovered from disasters um, and they could be natural disasters, they could be economic and so on, kind of date going back, you know, perhaps over the last 50 to 100 years and looking how cities have organised themselves to kind of respond to, to um, um, recover and the success to which they um, have um, managed to kind of recover. But also, of course, we're sharing data with other major cities across the UK and other networks of cities across Europe. We're, we're involved in a number of uh, pan-European projects involving kind of data and um, smart cities. So that those networks have been really, really helpful. And of course, some of the European cities are, or, so, or mainland European cities are ahead of us in the curve. So we can kind of learn from Italy and Spain and, and so on. Um, who are kind of a month or two ahead. So yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and it's really interesting that a lot of people have been going about this a similar sort of way. So it more kind of reinforces that, yeah, we're, we're going about this the right way. Great. OK, we have another question from Madeline Depp, who says, thank you for sharing this fascinating and important work. I'm curious if you could talk a little more about your work getting insights and feedback from health planners and how you're connecting with your prospective audience regarding the interactive tools. Hmm. So, so the audience is, is really tricky. We've done a lot of work on that. So I, I think it segments in a number of ways. So some of our partners will have their own analysts and actually what they want is an API. They do want access to the raw figures so they can do their own analysis. An awful lot of people um, say that particularly those responsible for some of the, the local neighbourhoods um, will want a tool that will help them answer very specific questions. So we're designing web-based tools with logins and, you know, kind of how busy was my high street this Saturday compared to the Saturday before or Saturday afterwards? How busy is it compared to some of my neighbours? And kind of um, 
allows me to kind of sort of dig into the bits I want to, but without overwhelming me with, with data. So um, we're building a number of tools aimed at different audiences, essentially. Um, that, that's our approach, because rather than creating one monster tool that tries to do everything. Great. OK, uh, we have, I think, time for just two more questions. Uh, the right. next question comes from Varsha Gopalakrishnan. Uh, the question is, you mentioned that the cameras detect humanoids and social distancing between people. Are you using this data to plan for the future to build streets that allow for more space between pedestrians? Hmm. I mean, that's how we plan for the future is a really interesting question. I mean, I could talk for another half an hour about how it how the London plan and kind of how it might affect how London develops in the next 20 years. It's it's only an estimate and what it will do is help us understand the extent to which we can promote people going back to high streets that are very still very quiet but also perhaps justify extending the space out into the road for those high streets that are getting busy because um, because there's always that tension where you're taking space away from the cars and the buses uh, you need to kind of justify that so it's helping people try and find that balance in their own local areas right Okay, and the last question comes from Alex Cabral. The question is, I was wondering if you could describe a bit more about the approach in combining the satellite and sensor data. As you mentioned, they have different resolutions, so I wonder how they were used together to get a sense of street level activity. So my best suggestion, given we've only got a, a minute or two, is to visit the Alan, if you Google, if you um, search for um, Alan Turing London Air Quality, you'll come up with the web page and there's lots of really, really good resources about the, the different types of modelling um, that they've investigated. So investigate about four different types of machine learning and then kind of hit on the, the one that gets the best kind of results. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, fascinating thank you. talk. Uh, our next speaker today is Luis Betancourt from the University of Chicago. Luis will be talking about transformative uses of data in cities. Luis, the microphone is yours. So uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, very interesting to be here with you. Um, very much looking forward to hearing about everyone's work and also the context that Microsoft is bringing to this theme. Um, this theme has been around for a little bit, and uh, I want to speak a little bit from the perspective of sort of a, a relatively new research institute, a research and education institute that's dedicated to this theme. So we'll become a little bit more from the point of view of research and education. And I thought that my role in, in discussion with, uh, with the um, organizers would be to uh, just reflect a little bit on uses of data in cities, what may be transformative and what is in some sense uh, more routine, uh, but may also still be useful. So I'll give you a fairly uh, high level talk about things that we've learned in the past and things that we're looking ahead. Um, so, uh, just in the way of introduction, this is our institute at the University of Chicago. It's called the Mansueto Institute for Urban Innovation. Um, and it's an institute dedicated to what we call urban science. So it's essentially the fact that increasingly we have ways, uh, as you've all seen, to study cities uh, more systematically, uh, more comparatively across the world. And this is revealing essentially a lot more about what kind of systems cities are, how they work, uh, and how they change. And in particular, uh, it's dedicated to, to a certain vision of change that has to do with the things that we need to improve in our cities, including uh, creating uh, more equitable and uh, uh, more sustainable cities going forward in the decades ahead in a critical way in an urban world. So um, as you know, uh, this has also uh, become important because it's not just the problem of London or Seattle or Chicago, it's a problem everywhere. And we have cities at many different levels of development and uh, with many different characteristics. And so to what extent can we say something general about um, how city, what cities are and how they change, and to uh, what extent can we actually work in particular places to create also what is desirable according to that context, but also what can be done. So in many ways, the, the reason to study cities is this, right? What cities do is this. This is Shanghai, and this is just 25 years. I like this picture. You can do this picture with almost any city in Asia. And in 25 years, you have a complete uh, transformation of what would have essentially an old fashioned city and country to a thoroughly modern one. Uh, what you see here is a change of the built environment. But most importantly, uh, you have to kind of imagine 
how people live in these two cities 25 years apart and uh, their lives are completely different in, in what they know and how they behave relative to each other and what they do for a living, what kind of services they have available. And this is kind of doesn't happen in any other system. So cities have a special role in transforming human societies. And this is a theme that um, I'll, I'll return to because in many ways there are uses of data that promote this kind of transformation and guide us towards societal objectives. And there are also uses of data that go against it. And uh, they're often very close and hard to distinguish in the short term. But, but this is kind of very important. Of course, this has happened in, in China in ways that are not sustainable and not particularly equitable. So there's a lot to be understood and a lot of uh, things to be done better. But this transformation in China is now happening all over the world in India and in Africa. And in China itself, it's taken about half a billion people out of poverty. So this is just amazing. OK, the context, of course, is that uh, both for science and for applications, we often, as you've heard already, talk about urban analytics as sort of more the data driven applied engineering level of uh, seeking change and guiding policy and urban science, which is its twin in terms of trying to understand the phenomena, are really guided by these two different uh, but uh, complementary phenomena. There's a digital revolution, so we're measuring all kinds of things. Most of them we didn't ask for. And there's a universal uh, uh, urbanization revolution in, in that almost every country in the world is urbanizing. Uh, its cities are changing and we have at the moment COVID aside, um, uh, significant, a significant pace of um, uh, economic development, societal transformations. This allows us to study cities in a way that are a little bit different from what we do uh, in engineering or in the natural sciences, namely by, of course, using a lot of new evidence and new computing uh, that we'll, you'll see throughout this workshop, I think, but also through comparative analysis. And comparative analysis is important because there's no standard for what a good city is. So often the best you can do is really compare places both across scales, for example, neighborhoods to cities or neighborhoods across the city, as you already saw a little bit for London, but also cities across an urban system for which you have to account for differences that are nonlinear in terms of their size effects and other effects, uh, but also cities across, uh, across the globe where you see effects of development and effects that also are cultural and having to do with policy and context and history. So I could spend a lot of time in this slide, I'm not going to, but cities are very, very complex systems and we're going to simplify them for the discussion that will follow. But they work at many different scales from the individual and their agency and cognition all the way up to urban systems. So the systems of cities and all of this uh, maps to different phenomena that affect many of the outcomes that we're interested in. So we study all this uh, in our institute and in terms of urban science, but uh, in many ways, uh, it's very hard to bring it to a discussion all at once. So I'm going to show you sort of just some windows and hopefully some uh, give you some insights and some framework to think about uses of data. So uh, my perspectives are in these four sources, so I'm just going to flash through them quickly. This is a paper I published a little while ago. It was published sort of at the height of the fever about smart cities, and it is in some sense a discussion of good and bad uses of data in cities. Um, this is a report that also Charlie Catlett and maybe several other people in the audience were involved in, including Craig Mundy, who at the time still worked at Microsoft, I think, or, is, or had just left Microsoft. This is for uh, 2016. It feels like a different, uh, a different uh, geological era. Um, it was one of the last reports that PCAST uh, did for uh, the Obama administration, and the idea was to chart a path for urban policy from the federal government. So it may be interesting for you, and uh, the second paragraph here, which I'm not gonna read, gives you a bit of the flavor of what we are trying to uh, map in terms of supportive infrastructure uh, that would have to come from the federal government to allow cities and local governments to do better, but also be able to uptake um, you know, uh, new skills uh, in terms of their staff and new technologies. This is a, a relatively new report, a little bit more science driven for the National Science Foundation. Uh, with more of an objective of looking towards sustainability. And this is a final one that's more European and it has to do with the digital transformation of urban spaces and what kind of policies are available. This has more of a social equity angle and may be interested in that, uh, in that uh, from their perspective. So I want to start with a warning, right? So my warning is the following. Uh, and, you know, uh, I think um, if I may think about this for every presentation and I think um, it will give you a lot of latitude and insight. The first is that data is not the solution. OK, so even though we'll spend maybe 90 percent or 80 percent of our time talking about data, how you create it, how you pipe it, where do you serve it, what do you do with it, how do you visualize it? Data is not the right, is not the solution. And 
in some sense, uh, for example, uses of machine learning uh, around data and so forth, uh, they're justified to the extent that we're dealing with stationary phenomena that repeat themselves and they have a sort of a well-defined normal a well-defined steady state. But in general, the past is not the right answer. And just look at cities today in terms of COVID, in terms of uh, issues of social justice, racism and so forth. And I think that should be clear. So in many ways, we need to have ideas and frameworks that take us from data and evidence in order to think about complex solutions for uh, issues uh, of cities. And technology is also not the key. Technology is very important. It changes the way we work. It amplifies what people can do. It really sometimes can render something that used to be complicated easy. But part of the, the issue is really the city is not primarily a massively engineered system. It is not. It is mostly about people, their interactions, what they do together, their agency, their opportunities, um, institutions that promote justice and opportunity. And technology may help with that. But uh, the recent history uh, since the introduction of the web, the last 20 years, as you know, is very mixed as to what technology has done, particularly in terms of equity in many ways it has exacerbated inequalities. So with that said, now we can go in. So talk about sort of techno utopias, and this is kind of what comes to mind. So what you're seeing here, uh, many of you will know, is essentially Mazdar City, which is one of the flagship programs for the IBM Smart Cities uh, program. And so this was uh, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, it still exists. It kind of looks a little bit like an office park today. It's not sort of a brave new world that sort of these slides show. But the idea was to create a, a place that was thoroughly modern in terms of its infrastructure and its management of services from solar power to everything being automated uh, to water being recycled to it having a low environmental footprint and the green one, as you can see. But this was not successful. It didn't attract a lot of people. And in some sense, it, this is not a city, right? It's just a shell for what could be a city, but it lacks socioeconomic activity. Um, if you look at other examples, I'll stop being negative in a second, but this is the second to last one in which I'm negative. This is the other IBM flagship project early on, which has to do with Rio. And uh, what it turned into, so Rio, of course, had a big push in terms of smart cities technology. Uh, and part of the idea is to be ready for the Olympics and the World Cup. And, uh, you know, if you visit Rio, I'm, I'm Portuguese, so part of my background will tell you that it's the most beautiful place on Earth. It's the marvelous city. But of course, it's a city that has a lot of social tensions and injustices. And in many ways, what the Smarter Cities program did, and this is a nice actually program, uh, paper in Medium by Eric Jaffe on some of its issues, was to exacerbate some of this, create in part or at least support a massive surveillance system. Um, and, you know, a lot of these control centers that tend to do this, sorry, London, I don't mean to imply that you're doing that. It sounded better than this. But in part, this is sort of the danger of these massive control centers when they move into the social economic realm is that they start essentially controlling the city uh, and controlling parts of the city that should not be controlled. They have to do with sort of people's expression and so forth. And so the last one uh, that was also canceled just recently, as you know, was you guys can rest at Microsoft because I'm not picking on you. This is, of course, partly your frenemies at Google. But as you know, um, uh, the Google project in Toronto, Toronto is a city that's thriving. It's very hard to do something that if you work with the city, the, the phenomena of the city, very hard to do something that would fail. But nevertheless, uh, essentially what happens is that if you try to create an alternative city based on technology, that's very hard. And in fact, had a lot of pushback and many reasons for this. But as you know, it was not very successful and it was not essentially what Google started up uh, wanting to do is to create a real city. So with that said, just these are sort of warnings for what we should not try to do with cities. We have to understand how they work and try to work with their systems and promote them. So. Uh, here's sort of my uh, mental frame uh, that I want to introduce to you quickly. It's part of some of those write-ups that I showed you and that uh, at least helps me think about how to use data and technology in cities. So this has two axes. The vertical axis goes from simple phenomena to complex phenomena. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain a little bit what I mean by that. But, uh, but by simple are things, you know, that we understood well and that have simple fast causality essentially. And then there's sort of a, another axis that may be less familiar that has to do uh, with homeostasis. And I, I describe this in terms of loops. So these are kind of the structures that allow you to manage systems that repeat. And these tend to do with fast things, okay? So things like delivering water and power and security to some extent. And then at the other extreme, you have issues of development, of change. These are very slow, take, uh, take um, place over decades typically or lifetimes. Uh, a little faster in China, as you've seen, but but these kind of build up 
on all kinds of the simple things and the homeostatic loops that make the city. But in some sense, the city exists at this top right corner. It's really the, uh, uh, the sum total of the complexity and of all the platforms that allows the city sort of as a socioeconomic system that's supported by infrastructure and services to function. Engineering tends to work sort of at the lower left, a space that is simple, that we understand, that's sort of more mechanical, if you will. And markets and uh, sort of urban governance tends to be at the level of these blue boxes where you tend to promote and facilitate individual behavior and choice. So there's a lot to climb to get to the city. And, uh, you know, I, I like to say that it takes a lot of institutions and a lot of organization to make people free and to give them opportunity. And the city is the best example of that. It requires a lot of structures that need to work and they need to be open ended to create good cities. And so the warning here is that uh, technology doesn't foreclose these. So the first paradigm, let's think about loops and simple systems. And so this is where the stuff of engineering and where the stuff of data most naturally uh, finds a home very quickly. And this is the stuff of urban analytics by and large. So uh, a simple problem is a problem for which we have a good metric of success, where we have fast real time data and where we have control variables that allow us to guide the functioning of the system towards those good metrics. So, for example, in the last maybe decade, we've had a revolution in terms of transit and traffic. So basically movement and mobility management uh, because we have so much better data through cell phones and other sensors on uh, where everything is. We have measures of demand through cell phones and we can dispatch and route uh, traffic in order to manage that much, much better. So this is a relatively, of course, uh, complicated problem, but conceptually simple in the in the sense that I'm bringing. So good examples, as I, I say there, are transportation, contagious diseases, but not yet COVID because we don't understand it very well, but also because we're botching the policy and we're not seeing as such. Uh, urban services, at least routine services, tend to fall into this category from fire protection to water to power to sanitation. This is not true in systems and places where these systems don't yet exist, like in developing cities. They need to create it. Uh, monetary policy is a different example where we control inflation by uh, changing the money supply. All these examples really don't have, don't need to have theory. There's not much theory. There's just a controlling variable and sort of a desired outcome that can be measured. And they require relatively narrow causality. What all these problems hide is that they're all much more complex problems if we lose control. And COVID again is a good example. It becomes a socioeconomic problem. It becomes a systemic public health problem becomes, of course, a massive economic problem. So bad examples of things that you should treat in this way with data and control are education, crime, chronic health, equity, you know, the things that we actually do really care about uh, trying to solve. So I spend a lot of time in these more complicated problems because I find it more interesting and more relevant. But I don't want to de-emphasize the fact that we need to have all these uh, simpler problems under control in terms of being able to spend time and energy and resources on these more complex things. So um, so let's talk about these more complex things. And I want to bring in the uh, concept of platform in terms of not a closed loop that we control, but of enabling structures a little bit beyond, but also touching on the idea of platform and technology, but also institutions are platforms that allow us to function collectively in different ways. So uh, I think you get the idea. So these are problems that are multidimensional, they're often qualitative, they're distributed in a population. So they have circular or systemic causality. So, uh, you know, I, uh, uh, they are slow or, or happen at long time scales. We don't have adequate rent measurements, at least presently, and they tend to be open ended. So I already give you examples, but there you go. Education and training, violent crime, chronic health, um, economic growth, systemic environmental change institutions. But generally you could talk uh, of them as a package in terms of human development and perhaps also environmental change. Um, so these problems require better systems, better information, better data. I'll speak a little bit more about this, but they also create sort of solving um, um, uh, coordination problems where people can come together and collaborate and act together in ways that are not usually facilitated easily. So these problems are often known as wicked problems in the planning literature and the policy literature, and they do require new conceptual advances. They require that we understand all this list of issues better such that in many ways we can carve out simple problems out of them and try to manage them uh, more routinely that way. So 
Um, so these, how do we solve these complex problems? So as I told you, I warned you that these are the things that we're more interested in. I think it's part of the mandate for this meeting that we're interested in things like health and equity. So they're sold through better information. Data plays a role through diverse collaboration, through new signals, so new ways for which people can see uh, the issue like you just saw for air quality in London, perhaps they can change behavior uh, through coordinated action and through learning. And cities do this list of things are things that happen in cities every day. So cities, in some sense, you can see them as uh, almost organizations that embed these properties and are able, given enough time, to solve these issues. And this is why it's so important to work with cities, with what's already happening in cities, though sometimes distributed and dysfunctional, to create systems like this that work better. So I put some things there that have to do with things we're doing. We, we're dealing a lot with uh, measures of the built environment, particularly in developing cities, and creating collaborations with locals. Uh, who are becoming planners of their own informal neighborhoods. I'll show you a couple of pictures in a second. I like what you're doing with our uh, urban heat islands and uh, creating sort of a platform to better study that. So I put it there, Scott. Uh, on this map of Chicago, you now know Chicago. Chicago is, is this beautiful, very stereotypical look that was invented by sociologists at, at the University of Chicago, where I work uh, almost 100 years ago. These are the community areas, and we measure in human development and try to track it over time. And you see a map that's somewhat similar to what uh, Scott showed for asthma. And these things are not coincidences. They coincide to a large extent. And health is one of the measures of human development. OK, so we're using the same data that you're all using, but in many ways, we're asking questions about cognition, about mixing, about opportunity. So this is just the cell phone map of Chicago. Uh, we are asking questions about local knowledge, about spaces of the city. This is uh, in Malawi, but we're doing this through a project throughout the world, including uh, in, in some ways that are different in Chicago. Um, and uh, we are using sort of this kind of amazing stuff that we're just seeing many of the built environments of the earth for the first time. This is again part of Africa, but Microsoft has played an important role in also revealing this for the United States. The problems are different, but nevertheless, there's an opportunity with this kind of high precision um, view of the built environment to start seeing the built environment as something that can be uh, adapted and changed and built in the first place to satisfy a systemic series of objectives rather than just narrow ones. So what we do with this is partly create ways in which we can start creating accesses and create models of planning that are more incremental, which is something that because of technology and because of also ideology, planners were never able to really do. OK, so this is my last slide and then we can uh, discuss a little bit. Uh, what I want you to uh, hopefully uh, retain from what I told you is that um, even though we're in the middle of a data revolution uh, and the data revolution in cities in terms of uh, almost any quantity you could ask for, um, these the data are being used in different ways and sort of the traditional way in which the smarter cities uh, movement started using data is really sort of on the left is through these loops of urban analytics. These loops have to do with governance, but they often even if they work well, they tend to freeze the city and they tend to simplify certain dynamics of the city. When those dynamics are well understood and they just have to do, for example, delivering buses on time or collect trash on time, that's fine even though those problems often will have to be opened up if you were starting to worry about, for example, about the pollution of those buses to pick up London's example and other things. But in some sense on the right, we have things that we have to always be doing, which, which is to create new platforms for collaboration, for learning and for data and new technical capabilities to uh, chip away at the more complicated and more aspirational problems of cities, which are many. Uh, working with the dynamics that's there already in cities and in this way creating really innovation and progress such that the future is the right answer uh, despite the past. So thank you. Thanks Luis. Um, very interesting talk. Uh, I have the first question for you myself and I'm wondering um, if you look five or ten years into the future, how do you see the best and potentially uh, most perilous uses of data in, in some of the ways that, that you're tracking it. Right, so uh, I'm concerned at the moment. So, you know, uh, obviously, for example, let's start with COVID. COVID is a good example because it's a system that's being formed very quickly, right? It's, it's all happening quickly, fortunately, the, some of the reaction, but we've never had the capacity to measure a contagious disease this fast throughout the world everywhere, right? It's very imperfect, but this is a very first. 
And the ability for the medical technology to strike to respond is amazing. And the ability for policy to start to respond is also extraordinary. We're kind of botching it, particularly in the US and you know, maybe in Britain too, the US particularly bad, but of course depends where. And so we haven't closed the loop, just speaking of loops, right? We haven't built a system in which we could even through behavioral changes that now are relatively well understood help at least from masks to uh, minimal social distancing, et cetera. We could do a lot better than we could, but we don't have a system that people accept as a series of causalities built in that would make a big, big difference. So that's one example. I think I think we'll go to that. People are talking in terms of a weather prediction, a little bit like London was doing for air quality, but also for uh, COVID and perhaps other uh, contagious diseases. So I think contagious diseases increasingly will come under control through these technologies and through sort of a well understood use of data uh, coupled to behavior and policy. But we have to be scientific about that and then implement systems that work. So that's one example. I think for the other more complicated problems, we need to find ways in which data is actually not coming from above uh, and not coming uh, and in many ways is enabling people that are close to problems of human development to actually uh, both imagine and own and, and collaborate towards futures that both respect context and agency, but also create better outcomes. This is true throughout developing cities. Uh, I just showed you the problems often have to do with services and basic governance, and it has to do with uh, inequality in American cities and British cities and other more developed cities. And uh, I think the data and technology are very helpful, but I think we're not deploying them in the right ways. Great, thank you. Um, our next question comes from John Fink. Uh, and the question is, to what extent do you think the failures of Mazdar, Rio and Toronto waterfront have been due to the top down approach from a single vendor as opposed to having more local engagement and diversity of solution providers? No, that's absolutely part of it. So I, I said work with the city, and that would be one aspect of working with the city, working with local agents in the city who know the city, who are part of it, who are stakeholders. Uh, but I think they also have to do with a couple other cognitive dissonances. The one I, I mentioned was this engineering perspective versus the city as a richer, more complex environment. I think there's another one that uh, it, which has to do with private sector versus public sector. I mean that in most abstract terms, in terms of that, what I mean by public sector is just essentially try to represent, you know, the public well-being, uh, meaning that everyone needs to be included, have a minimal level of service and so forth, versus uh, what the technology sector has done a lot, which is to create trickle-in solutions that benefit people, you know, like the share economy is a good example, right? Who starts using Uber and Lyft, it, it trickles down to, to people potentially along lines of education and uh, income. And in many ways, it contributed to eroding tra transit because people that uh, had more choice uh, stopped using some of these, uh, some of the transit alternatives. So there's sort of a race to the bottom. So we have to kind of be wary as to when we introduce, particularly when we do massive interventions as these wanted to be, that we are aware that what we're doing is intervening in a very complex system with feedbacks and with the public interest in mind. And if we can do that, we can use technology much better. But if we do that in the wrong mindset, with the wrong framework, with the wrong intentions, it's going to not work and you're going to be rejected as these efforts effectively work, but with a lot of opportunity cost. Great. Our next question comes from Sifeng Chen. The question is, how do you see data analytics being used to evaluate and build climate resilience in cities? OK, so climate is uh, works at many different scales. So if we emphasize resilience, uh, you, you tend to emphasize, you know, how that city and those neighborhoods deal with uh, drives from climate. So there are many things depending on context. One has to do with the well-being of people in those contexts, for example. So what we know about cities that we're finding through some of the sensors that Scott was telling us about is that of microclimates, right? So cities are themselves a microclimate because they retain a lot of heat and have their own dynamics. It tends to rain more, at least in cities with high skylines. There's a bunch of things like this, but uh, but they can create environments that are more comfortable, less comfortable to people, and they're more or less resilient to extreme events like flooding and water, water, water flows and so forth. So uh, data analytics would allow us to understand the these heterogeneities and start designing 
around things that work better. So, but this is not rocket science. We know a little bit about it, but we don't know how the whole system would work better. But data analytics are starting to be incorporated into the design and both design of buildings, the way architects have been doing. Of course, it's it's now mainstream, but also design of districts or, or, or urban areas so that the design is not just local, but starts having to do with water flow and airflow and things like this. Um, I think there are other questions then that have to do with transformations in light of new, uh, new energy technologies. Uh, you know, how do we embed these into the built environment? What kind of transformations they create? which are both physical, to do with energy and pollution, and then to do with socioeconomic impacts. And those are a bit more complicated. Great, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, this one comes from Dev Niyogi. The question is, could you comment on the possibility or example in the context that while we have the data that is now possible, we have still not paused uh, for bigger questions. There seems to be a very vague intent in smart or resilient cities context quite often. Well, I agree. I hope that you appreciated that I gave this talk a little bit in that spirit to open up that window. I think it's very important that even as we do applied things that solve specific problems, that we have the bigger picture in mind, that we really are working in a system that has broader objectives than our own objectives, but objectives of many different people. Um, and um, I, I think that it's been tempting, particularly to policymakers who like to simplify things to to engage this way, but also if I may, and forgive me, Microsoft and friends, I think it's been also the tendency, I'm not talking about you, as you saw, the examples I picked were not you. Uh, uh, technology companies have simplified the problem. And it's, uh, I find that kind of interesting because if you look at the great successes of technology in the last 20 years, uh, from search, and Scott was showing us examples that were in a different spirit, I think, I like those, or maps or other things that, uh, even the share economy itself, is really riding on some phenomena that already happened in cities, right? Cities always had a share economy and they always needed sort of symbolic systems that live on top of the built environment such that people organize their lives efficiently. Cell phones are, you know, immediately uh, used in cities and they're super useful. So a lot of the technology has been embedded in using these environments, but yet when technologists uh, want to be more aggressive and create sort of top-down solutions, they tend to get it wrong. Whereas when they lay back and they enable solutions, they tend to get it really right and create really vital, interesting things. So I think it's important to see those two perspectives and engage with uh, with what really happens in cities. And I think we'll do better that way. Uh, and I think here, uh, I just encourage us to have that discussion. And as I hope, as I said in the beginning of my talk, that we keep that discussion alive as we go through the various talks and discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Luis, a very interesting talk. Um, our next speaker is Bill Fulton, who comes to us from Rice University. Um, Bill will be talking about how COVID-19 will change cities. Uh, and Bill, the microphone is yours. All right, thanks very much. Uh, I'm Bill Fulton. I'm the director of the Kinder Institute for Urban Research at Rice University. That's kind of a similar uh, institute to Luis's Institute at, at the University of Chicago. Um, and uh, uh, I'm going to talk, uh, at a, I'm an urban planner by training, and I'm going to talk at, a, at an even higher level and not a very data-oriented level about uh, what I think, how I think cities are going to change after COVID, and then what that means for, um, uh, we can debate in the breakout session, for example, what that's going to mean for uh, uh, for data and data analytics. At, at the Kinder Institute, we do some data, we also do some policy. So um, as Luis's talk seemed to indicate, uh, the <clears throat> density, which is kind of under attack at the moment because of, of COVID, is the very essence of a city. It is the proximity of people and activities to one another that makes a city work and that makes a city such an attractive place, not only economically, but socially as well. Well, and as you can see, people are a little afraid of density right now. This is this is a recent scene in downtown San Diego where I used to live. Uh, it doesn't always look like this, but sometimes uh, it, it does look more like that than it does here. And a lot, and there has been a lot of discussion in urban planning circles about whether or not density is bad, whether or not cities will go into decline. Are cities over? Uh, there's been a, there have been articles about is New York over? Uh, are suburbs? Is everybody moving to the suburbs? Um, I don't think it's that simple, but I do think there are some changes coming that we can talk about and that in the breakout session uh, on cities after COVID, we can discuss how data analytics can assist in the coming transition. 
Um, uh, uh, cities are thousands of years old. They're often regarded as humankind's greatest and most complex creation. In Throughout history, they have never ended, not really. Uh, they've only ever just evolved and usually gotten bigger in the end. And so I think that that's probably what's going to happen here. And I'd like to talk about a few of the patterns that I think are going to change that we can discuss. Um, I brought this slide in because cities are already changing in this sense. I always wonder how is she going to drink both of these glasses at the same time with her mask on? That's, that's just my, my question. Um, so a few things that are going to happen. Number one, we all know because we are all at home right now, more people will engage in remote work. There will be more people working at home or in remote locations, not necessarily at home, more of the time than ever before. Um, this is going to have significant impact on our society and a significant impact on how people work and how the daily flow of our cities functions. So, for example, is that going to allow us to rethink mobility? Is rush hour going to be not as bad as it's been in the past? Well, you know, I've predicted this in the past at the dawn of the telecommunications age, at the dawn of the internet age, I said Los Angeles' freeways would be cleared out because of, uh, of what I called at the time economic, uh, 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 electronic travel. This turned out to be not true, and it's actually been true throughout history that increased telecommunications activity and interaction has always led to more travel. So we don't know whether uh, this is whether how this is going to change mobility. Is it going to allow us to is is travel going to change in a say in a city going to change during the course of a day? Is it going to go up overall? Is it going to be more prominent in the middle of the day and less prominent at rush hour? We don't really know, but that's one thing that's going to happen. Another thing that's going to happen is that bricks and mortar retail buildings are going to crash and burn and there are going to be retail establishments, shopping malls, strip centers all over America and in fact all over the world that are going to mostly be vacant and that are mostly going to be uh, empty. And what's going to go in them or what's going to happen to that land? That we don't know either. I would say a couple of things might happen. Uh, one is that you might see, for example, uh, people who do not want to work at home but do not want to commute to the office uh, using these locations as sort of um, neighborhood co-working centers, right? Um, that might change travel patterns. Uh, that would certainly change the flow of city life, um, and it would also change, uh, and it would, and it would also change the use of these uh, old strip centers. It's also quite likely uh, that we will see uh, strip centers, uh, lots of them torn down and replaced with housing. Um, what are we going to do with all the WalMarts? What are we going to do with all the targets? What are we going to do with all the mom and pop retail stores that are in the process of going out of business? Um, uh, will we be able to reprogram these retail malls so that workspace will be successful? I really do believe that there is a place in the market for retail, uh, I'm sorry, for workspaces, for, for co-working spaces to exist uh, all over the place. Not just in we work in cool locations in downtowns in Brooklyn and Oakland and so forth, but all over the place, including in suburbs. And I think that's going to make a big going to make a big difference. I will say a couple of other things. One is obviously the demand for office space in big job centers like downtowns, not exclusively downtowns, but like downtowns, is going to decline. And what happens uh, when to all that office space? when those people do not need to go to the office space anymore. In a big downtown or a big job center, I think a lot of that's going to get flipped to housing. I was just reading Richard Florida this morning, uh, tweeting about that, saying that's probably going to happen. I think it is. And that changes the whole nature of dense, what have up to now been dense employment centers. They're not just about employment or office or jobs anymore. Now they're about where people live and about how they spend their time. Um, I will also say that uh, let me dive, let me let me deviate from my slides for a minute to say there's a lot of discussion about where people, if they can live anywhere, if they are going to uh, work remotely, where they are going to live, where are they going to live, and there, the answer is 
we don't know. We're not sure. We don't know how many people, a, a lot of commentators have been saying, well, everybody's going to move far out into the suburbs because they can, because they're not tethered to a commute. And I think that's probably the wrong approach. I think the answer is probably people are going to uh, have a better opportunity to live where they want to live. For some people that may be in cities, for some people that may be in dense older suburbs, for some cities that may be uh, it, far out. I don't think there's any question that we'll see more sprawl and that could create more traffic. Uh, but I think it also means that they, there might be more demand for desirable locations in cities as we have seen. I think as well, like I said, downtowns and job centers are gonna continue to evolve into more diverse activity centers. This is a good example of what's going on all over the country. This is in San Diego and Little Italy downtown where I used to live. <clears throat> and you can see this is where outdoor dining is occurring. And I think what we're gonna see all over the country is uh, uh, particularly where the weather allows it, mostly in the Sun Belt, is we're gonna see more, lo more, uh, uh, more activity, more outdoor urban activity all over the place. So we're gonna see people working remotely. We're gonna see uh, downtowns emptying out of jobs. We're going to see people, we're going to see a lot of retail businesses and stores uh, who, that are out going out. And we're going to see a lot of reshaping or rethinking of urban neighborhoods and not just downtowns, but regular neighborhoods as well. I think what we're going to see, for example, is if people work at home more, then they're going to expect more out of their neighborhood. They're going to want greater diversity of uses. I think, you know, restaurants and bars are crashing and burning right now, but I don't think it'll be long before they come back and, and they come back very strong. That's one of the things people miss the most. And if you work at home, if you're an office worker and you work at home all the time, are you really going to be satisfied by having nothing but an Applebee's uh, near your house, or are you going to want a little more urban diversity like you used to have when you went to the office? So I think, like I say, there are a series of trends going on here that are going to fundamentally and permanently change our cities. And I'm really interested to know, um, I'm really interested to know how data will be used to support this transition and to make this transition work. The last thing I'll say is um, there's a lot of publicity, as you all probably know, about whether or not cities are going to have any money for the next few years. And I think the answer to that is no. So we're going to see a shift between um, a shift, a shift in power, I think, and a shift in how cities are shaped from uh, going on the from on the one hand, city governments themselves to private entities and quasi governmental entities. So again, uh, to summarize, you're going to see a lot more people working at home. You're going to see uh, a lot of retail vacant space. You're going to see downtowns empty out of jobs. You're going to see, but I think you're going to see both downtowns and suburban locations become more diverse in their activities. It's impossible to predict the mobility challenge, what the mobility uh, pattern is going to be. And I think that is one of the great challenges of data. As Luis said, we have so much greater power to track uh, transportation, transport now than we did only a few years ago because of, uh, because of cell phone data and so forth. But where is this going? We really don't know. And then I think there's the question of who is going to control and who is going to shape these new city districts? Is it going to be the municipal governments themselves, or is it going to be private entities like companies and, and business districts? And if so, how do they use data and who controls it? So I think those are a few things. That's This is not a data-oriented talk, but I think those are a few things that we can think about as we move forward and think particularly about U.S. cities uh, post-COVID. And I, 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 I'd love to answer any questions, and I look forward to the breakout session later. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate your thoughts on all of this. Um, uh, it's interesting to have, uh, you know, your crystal ball view of where you see the, the trends heading. Um, and uh, I, I wonder if you might say, if we might push you just a little bit to dig a little deeper on the role of data in these sort of predetermined sounding um, trends, I guess, uh, for lack of a better word, that, you know, you're, you're anticipating. Um, should should city planners, uh, should other agencies 
be uh, somewhat heavy handed in helping to facilitate these natural trends or should they continue to try and guide people in ways that that they see more beneficial for society from their own view? Uh, I, I think I think that city planners are going to have to facilitate what's going on. And I think that uh, 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 city planners are going are to have to figure out how to use data in a much more effective in a much more effective way. Um, back to what Luis said, city planners often yield the data to engineers, the whole data, the whole field of data to engineers. And that leads to a certain set of outcomes that, that are driven by engineering principles and often not by the human scale and the human principles that are often accompanied by, by city planning. Um, I will say that uh, one of the most powerful things that is happening now is our ability to use what you might call soft human oriented data. Uh, and, and, and back to the point about Waterfront Toronto and, and, and others, uh, there's such an enormous amount of data out there, not just about uh, um, uh, uh, how cities are, but about how, but about what people actually do on a minute-to-minute -minute and day-to-day -day basis. There's huge privacy issues there. We saw with Waterfront Toronto and 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 Sidewalk Labs some of the risks, but nevertheless, the data is going to be there and so overwhelming, and both private and public entities are going to be so have so much access to it. That I, that I think we need to learn how to use that data to shape our future in a more constructive way and probably, as others have said, in a more ground up way. Great, our next question comes from Scott Counts. Uh, can you talk a bit about the relationship between free market impact on COVID-induced urban change and policy-driven change? In other words, what can or should we do policy-wise to turn this into the best possible change? Yeah, that's a really good question. What role should policy play? I, I think what I described in large part was market trends, right? Uh, a decline in the, the demand for office space and a decline in the demand for retail space. Um, this puts business districts all over the country and all over the world at risk. And it also uh, uh, holds the potential to exacerbate the inequities that we see in cities today. So I, I think what we have to do is use some of the policies that, that we have used in the past and that we know work, such as investing in, I, I think investing in neighborhood business districts is one of the most important things that cities or quasi-public entities are gonna have to do in order to prop them up. Um, uh, so I, 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 I think that we're gonna have it, if all we did was let the free market take, it, take its course, we would probably have a lot of empty space for a long time, right? Both retail space and office space. And so what we're gonna have to do is use policy to make sure uh, that we that the trends that we're looking for and the trends we hope will exist, including more diversity in urban neighborhoods and in suburban neighborhoods, more diversity of uses occurs. So that, that's gonna inevitably require some subsidies and some regulatory breaks to developers. Our next question comes from John Fink. Can you comment about how you see urban economic disparities evolving given the trends you describe? Yeah, hello, John, thanks. Um, I think they're gonna get worse uh, because already, as many people know, uh, in urban neighborhoods and even in older suburban neighborhoods, uh, particularly when you look at commercial space, particularly retail space, those, those neighborhood business districts and many of those businesses were hanging by a thread they're going to be the first ones to go and not only in cities there's a big debate right now over cities versus suburbs <clears throat> that's been uh, re-stimulated by the president um, <clears throat> but i think it's important to understand that many older suburbs are now diverse they're they're demographically diverse they're economically diverse and and there are a lot of mini malls and shopping centers that that are hanging on by a thread and that will probably fall and when they do what that means is people of more modest means will not have access to uh, the amenities that other people in urban and suburban life will have and that's an enormous problem that i think public policy and governmental policy is going to have to address all right our next question comes from ron cohen how do you think we get the right information for planning for schools? How, uh, for you mean for 
I, I Ron, I assume you mean how do we get the right information in planning for in planning for schools to um, uh, for where to place schools in the future? I assume that's what he's talking about. Um, uh, uh, if that's the case, uh, that's getting harder than ever as school choice becomes more more important. I, I maybe post I see postcode. We're talking about post COVID schools, right? I think well, my wife's a teacher and she doesn't know what to do. I think that's almost impossible. But I and I think one of the things that's going to happen, and this is going to happen throughout urban life, is we are going to see um, is that we are going to see. Um, uh, uh, a move to dual platform delivery of everything, right? We're going to see a dual platform delivery of everything. Uh, and so therefore, I think schools are going to have to adapt to that. And that's going to make schools very, very different. And it may as well make the demand for actual physical space in schools go down as well. And schools have always been the bedrock of neighborhood uh, in, of neighborhood stability. And if they become shrink and they become smaller and they go partly online, what does that do to uh, to the fabric of a neighborhood? And Ron did confirm that yes, that is what he was asking. OK. Um, our next question comes from Sean Jansen. Yes, we are seeing a massive push to remote work, most recently due to issues such as COVID-19. But is this more of a fad rather than long lasting trend? Major social and technological challenges such as the di digital divide in homes or accessing sensitive data and systems remotely or managerial challenges such as IBM's recall of its remote workforce to back to IBM offices around 2017 might offset long lasting effects. What leads you to believe that it will be as long lasting and extreme as you suggest? We have never witnessed this kind of a shift to remote work ever. Um, I understand the concerns about security. Uh, there is no question that some office based workers will have to will continue to have to go to work, particularly those who deal with sensitive data or those who are in higher positions. But currently half of the workforce is working at home. Half of the workforce has been working at home since March. Most of them are probably not going to go back to an office until next year. And so and it's clear to me that both employees and employers have become much more comfortable with the idea of remote work. Productivity in many office environments has remained high. I will say that one of the most important things that this whole situation has revealed about cities is the divide between people who are able to work at home and people who must go to work, many of whom are essential workers who are lower paid. So there's an enormous socioeconomic divide between, frankly, people like us who are sitting at home in front of our computers and people who are retail workers, who are bus drivers, who are sanitary, who are picking up the trash. That's an enormous divide, one, one half of us being home at work in a relatively safe environment and being productive, the other half of us out there being, being risky. And I think one of the biggest concerns that we have to address in cities in the future is how do you make sure that this, uh, not uh, this COVID divide, this health divide, this, this office versus other type of work divide doesn't get bigger and bigger and create even more inequities in our communities and in our neighborhoods. All right, we have one more question. Uh, this one comes from Kristen Lauder. The question is, can you talk a little bit about the Kinder Institute and your focus and mission? Yes, the Kinder Institute is, we like to say, a think and do tank. It is based at Rice University. It is focused primarily on Houston and to, to a lesser extent on other Sunbelt cities. Uh, we focus primarily on uh, uh, change in the Houston region, particularly having to do with transportation, housing and education. Uh, increasingly, obviously, we also deal with the inequities in the region, but it's part of a larger connection, uh, connection between Rice University and the city of Houston. I will say as well uh, uh, that, that Rice University is involved with, uh, with, other, with some tech companies and others in a, in a new innovation center, and that we have seen a, a rise in Houston of civic tech like we haven't seen before. Super. Thank you, Bill, very much for your thoughts and uh, responses to all these questions. Sure thing.
Our next speaker is Tom Baer. Tom comes to us from Stanford, uh, and he'll be sharing his thoughts on creating a global network of smart cities, the Global Environmental Measurement and Monitoring Initiative. Tom, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much, uh, and I appreciate you inviting me to be a part of the uh, Microsoft Urban Innovation Workshop. I'm very pleased to see that Microsoft is exploring how to contribute their vast resources to help solve some of the most pressing problems facing cities around the world today. In my presentation, I'll be discussing programs that I've been coordinating involving some of the world's leading scientific societies working on addressing very similar challenges. Several of the speakers presenting at this workshop are working with me on these programs as a part of a global environmental measurement and monitoring initiative. We are all excited to explore how we can work with Microsoft on addressing problems facing cities today. My collaborators in the GEM initiative are world recognized experts in the areas of measuring and monitoring urban pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. And I'm sure you will enjoy hearing their expert perspectives. Uh, I will let them deal with those topics in my presentation. I will describe how these urban focused initiatives are related to and bear great similarities to other activities of the GEM initiative dealing with the general challenges of climate change and human health. So why are the scientific societies focusing on this right now? Some of these are obvious uh, answers to that question. Uh, there is a real critical need for accurate models to predict global and regional consequences of climate change. These predictions are needed really to effectively uh, design and deploy appropriate infrastructures to mitigate and adapt to climate change. The public policy decisions have enormous e economic impacts and uh, the ability to predict and measure the impact and efficacy of these different uh, infrastructure initiatives is absolutely critical. Moreover, there have been a number of international agreements that have been negotiated and agreed to, and there have been very little plans actually for how to measure compliance. One example of these is the cap and trade agreements for carbon emissions, and most of these are based on bottoms up estimates, which are pretty much viewed as not being sufficient to provide the accuracy necessary to be able to effectively quantitate carbon emissions in a cap and trade system. Uh, the economic impacts, of course, are enormous. We'll be talking about urban population health. Uh, there's going to be forced migrations due to climate change. Again, extreme weather events are going to impact economies all over the world. Coastal city inundation, inundation is predicted due to sea level rise, changes in agriculture. But there are also economic opportunities uh, for developing new infrastructures for adaptation and mitigation. Uh, the development of stable, renewable, non-fossil fuel based energy economies and commercial opportunities for the development and deployment of new measurement technologies. So one of the things I wanted to discuss was some of the common challenges facing the ability to interact effectively with the public policy decision makers. And in general, these uh, bear uh, directly on what we'll be talking about today. Typically, the way science gets involved with uh, uh, guiding uh, policy is to develop uh, dense networks or networks of measurements, both uh, time sequence measurements and spatially diverse measurements of uh, critical climate change and uh, other environmental variables. These uh, sequences, both in time and space, go into temporal and spatial models, which then are used to make predictions of what's going to happen in the future. And these models and uh, of future predictions then guide policies to mitigate and adapt to uh, what are the projected changes in the environment. Uh, in general, what happens then is uh, the you go back and look at these measurement systems that have been put in place to evaluate did the policies have uh, the correct impact and was that due to poor modeling or was it due to just poor policies? And this is how we as a scientific community can contribute to the overall guiding and effective decision making of government policymakers. And that's really what the Global Environmental Measurement and Monitoring Initiative is all about. There are some common data challenges that are going to be faced by uh, urban planners, as well as by other aspects of doing environmental uh, research and supplying input to policymakers. First of all, the data needs to be taken at high spatial and temporal resolutions for the more part in order to develop and constrain uh, models of where things are going in the future. 
Uh, data comes from a variety of sources that we've heard in earlier talks, networks, dense ground-based networks, airplanes, and satellite platforms, and I'll show you some examples of those. The instruments need to be accurate and the measurements reproducible. In general, they'll have to be agreed upon international standards for how you make these measurements in order to have a compliance agreement and compliance with, uh, with treaties and national agreements that have been negotiated. The technology must be affordable. And of course, Microsoft has been taking the lead on, uh, on this in the urban environment. And, uh, but in general, this is a challenge for many different measurement platforms that need to be put in place to monitor and uh, the uh, environmental changes that are ongoing. Software will need to be developed, and this is an important role that Microsoft could play to incorporate the data into useful predictive models. Some of the data is gonna be confidential, and so methods need to be developed where the confidential data can be processed using open source software, probably cloud-based, and, uh, and shared with a limited subset uh, of, of, of collaborators. And so this type of process where data can be kept confidential and yet processed using open open source platforms is something that will need to be developed. Uh, cloud resources have to be developed for the secure data storage and computation and models need to be articulated in order to provide useful information to government officials to guide effective policy decisions. In other words, we got to translate the data that we're collecting in the models into a language and into forms that our, our policymakers can actually use. So let me show you some examples. Uh, hopefully you can see this video. This is an example of a model of CO2 circulation that was developed by NASA about 10 or 15 years ago. And it's a beautiful model that recapitulates or recreates a lot of the dynamics that go on in the atmospheric circulation. It, it recapitulates the Arctic vortex and the, and the Antarctic vortex, various gears that uh, take place, circulations that take place over the ocean. And if you look closely, you'll see that uh, this pulsing that occurs in the uh, South America Amazon uh, rainforest. And that's due to the daily respiration of the rainforest. These are beautiful models. And if you go through and speed this up a bit, you'll actually see the change of the season that take place. This is during the winter months where there isn't much foliage, the carbon dioxide. Now this is during the summer where the carbon dioxide is essentially removed from the atmosphere by the, the growth of foliage in the, in the uh, Northern hemisphere. These are beautiful models, they're very complex and they take data from a variety of sources. Just, I wanted to show this. This is where the NASA simulation was developed. If you had looked closely at the maximum level that was plotted in those things, it was actually, in those graphs, it was actually 395 parts per million. Today, we're already, those graphs and models would be obsolete because we're already up at 410 parts per million today. So even in those last 15 years, we've seen a very disturbing rise in the, in the fossil fuel CO2 emission that's in the atmosphere. So these models are complex. They take input from a whole variety of coupled subsystems. The atmosphere, the biosphere, cryosphere, geosphere, and hydrosphere are all coupled together. They all exchange energy, momentum, chemistry, and mass. And these combined elements uh, coupled together is really what creates our environment. So these models are extremely complex. And just to give you an idea, for example, how the atmosphere couples uh, to the hydrosphere through, uh, through, through oceans and fresh waters, through the evaporation and condensation, through transfer of momentum with wind and waves, chemistry exchange through oxygen, CO2, and pH levels, and then momentum or mass exchange just through evaporation and condensation. The geosphere has urban heat islands. Uh, there's permafrost that's, that's in the process of, of melting uh, and then decaying. There's volcanic emissions. The cryosphere, of course, gets snow and ice, which changes the, the, uh, the reflectivity of the Earth and the absorption of solar radiation. And the biosphere has a number of contributions in term of terms of chemistry and mass with the atmosphere. These are very complicated problems. And the models that we just showed basically incorporate all of these coupled systems into, their, uh, into the calculation of the final results. The problem is that many of these processes here are not accurately measured. They're parameterized. They're, they're estimated in terms of what we understand, in terms of the physical processes. And that means that these models are not very well constrained. So they are limited in their predictive capability. And they're particularly limited, the global models, and what's going to happen on a regional basis. And so we, we have a need to be able to develop models that allow us to predict uh, more uh, closely what's going on, 
Another problem is just the difficulty of these systems. This, for example, is a, uh, the, the calculations are what are called an inverse problem. And it involves uh, calculating from a set of measurements at a certain time period, the events that caused those measurements to occur. So it's like trying to predict the act of pouring the milk or cream into this cup of coffee from the, uh, the various, uh, various uh, turbulent mixing that occurs later on in time. It's a very difficult problem to do and to get to converge. So these are tremendous scientific and technical challenges re requiring a, a considerable amount of investment in, uh, in uh, uh, mathematical formulation. Once again, one of the major problems facing policymakers, is a lot of the impact of, of the climate is regional. And these uh, global models do not do a good job of predicting the regional impact of climate change. For example, the changes in the Arctic, uh, uh, the Arctic sea ice uh, have, have not been accurately predicted by these models for the most part. The local distribution of, of uh, uh, both fossil fuel and, and air pollution within an urban environment is difficult to predict from the global models. More detailed measurements need to be put in place in order for these measurements to be incorporated into models that uh, provide accurate predictions of what's going to happen. And then things like uh, agricultural runoff in, in, that creates the dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico are also extremely difficult uh, to predict from any global models, it require a local measurement. And I'm gonna go through some of these, these measurement systems in, in detail to show how similar they are in terms of the challenges that are facing uh, what we're trying to do within the cities. So why do we wanna do this? Basically, if you want to be able to predict what's gonna happen on a regional basis, you have to be able to measure it in order to be able to manage it, in order to be able to develop uh, uh, effective uh, government policies on a regional basis, we have to know in detail what's going on and, and develop models that allow us to predict the future. So let me give you some examples that are related to what we're hoping to be able to provide and enable smart cities with. This is a beautiful example of one of the first international networks that were put in place. It's called the Argo float system. This is a series of several thousand floats that have been put into the, uh, into the various oceans around the world that monitor key variables in terms of ocean dynamics. It's a joint effort by about 30 different uh, countries represented by all the colors in the graph here. And uh, it, the data is shared and, uh, uh, between the, the various participants uh, in an open source format. This is easier to do than making these measurements in cities because these waters are considered to be international waters. So there isn't a real proprietary aspect of this data. So this is somewhat easier than a lot of the other challenges we're gonna face in terms of, of sharing and uh, sharing city, uh, city data. These floats are remarkable pieces of technology. Uh, they, are, uh, they exist on the surface and then they have a pump which allows them to, uh, to uh, submerge down to about 2,000 meters, about 6,000 feet. They take measurements of temperature and salinity as they go down. They drift with the currents. They come up to the surface then after a certain amount of time and they broadcast to a satellite the, the data that they've collected, which is then collected and consolidated. Uh, the types of data is, is really revolutionizing our understanding of what's going on in the ocean. On the left is the temperature of the surface as, as you go through uh, the various seasons. On the right is the subsurface temperatures. And these are the first time that these measurements have been made on a global basis. And it's this type of measurement that then couples into the global climate models that I, that I showed earlier to show, to show the transfer of heat and momentum between the, uh, the oceans in the atmosphere. These are critical measurements and it really relies on the uh, international cooperation and the development of these, these uh, consolidated data sets to be successful. The first generation of floats basically measured salinity, temperature, position, and velocity. So you measure the currents by, by having a GPS on the floats. The next generation is going to be, and that's being uh, put in the field right now, is going to be able to measure much of the ocean chemistry that goes on and be able to then incorporate these into more sophisticated models of climate change. So these, this is the next generation. One of the most important sensors in this is the nitrate sensors. And these are built into the top part of these, uh, of these uh, uh, floats. And they're monitoring the nitrate concentration as a function of position, and as a function of time. And these are also being these similar sorts of nitrate monitors are being, uh, being deployed in rivers around the country to, to uh, be able to measure agricultural runoff 
and to be able to monitor its impact on, on the ocean uh, fauna uh, in, uh, in various parts of the, uh, of, the, of the world. Here it's indicated what's going on in the U.S., particularly in the state of Iowa, where, these, uh, where agricultural runoff and nitrate pollution is a significant problem. Other aspects of the hydrosphere that are being measured are saltwater incursion, which is a significant problem, viewed as a significant problem uh, having to do with climate change and sea level rise, where the, the additional sea level rise is going to change the distribution of salt water. It's going to infuse into fresh water uh, uh, resources that are utilized for agricultural near the coast. This is particular, particularly an important problem uh, associated with what's going on in California, because a lot of the agriculture is right at the coast in California, and there's considerable concern that we be able to track and measure and mitigate where we can uh, the impact of the saltwater incursion on, uh, on, on freshwater resources near the coast. Of course, there's a general problem in terms of predicting freshwater resources in terms of uh, Sierra snowpack within the uh, California situation. And this is uh, an area where, again, the, the global climate models just don't give us the predictive capability to know what infrastructure we need to put in place in order to be prepared for changes in these, uh, the freshwater resources to support uh, both the communities uh, in California as well as industry. Another area that we're heavily involved with in the Global Environmental Measurement Monitoring uh, Initiative is the measurement of what's going on in the Arctic. Uh, and this is part of the uh, Sentinel North program that, that is part of our GEM network that's run out of the University of Laval uh, uh, in, Can in Northern Canada, Quebec. And this is a massive program uh, that's been supported by the Canadian government and it involves a, a very large uh, uh, geography and a number of indigenous communities. And they're looking at monitoring key elements of the Arctic environment here in terms of the thawing permafrost and CO2 and, and methane emissions, uh, the warming atmosphere as the Arctic ice melts, the changing ecosystems, the, biosystem, uh, the, the biosphere within the Arctic Ocean as it warms, and uh, overall the melting, uh, uh, melting of the glaciers and ice sheets in, in the northern regions, including Canada and Greenland. Uh, this is important because these changes that occur within the Arctic environment and in the Antarctic environment really affect the whole world. Uh, we see a change in the Arctic ice is going to affect the global heat balance. That then uh, disturbs the, uh, the Arctic vortex, which, uh, which we feel in the United States. Uh, the sea level rise due to the ice melting is going to be impacting many coastal cities around the world. Permafrost is considered to be, and the melting of, uh, of uh, uh, permafrost or thawing of permafrost is going to uh, have a uh, right now unpredicted impact on both CO2 and methane release into the atmosphere and many other uh, uh, ramifications, including just the opening up the sea ice is going to change global trade routes and have both environmental and trade impact on the countries that, that surround the Arctic Ocean. What we'll be hearing about today is another effort that's been supported by the GEM initiative, and this is the monitoring of urban environments using dense networks of both trace gas pollution and CO2, uh, CO2 levels. And this is just an example that's going to be talked about in quite a bit of detail of uh, distribution of sensors within the Bay Area that is monitoring some very interesting changes due to policies that put in place for the COVID-19 situation. And so we'll hear about this in detail from Ron Cohen, who has helped uh, organize the, uh, the JAM initiative here in Northern California. Another example here is uh, of, of a dense network of monitoring stations, the Purple Air Network. And this is a community science-based uh, uh, operation that uses very low cost sensors, particle sensors that are internet linked, that are, cost about $200 each. There are thousands of these sensors all around the world, and they are linked together and provide maps of this sort which are then uh, uh, searchable. And I just put in a, the street address that's about a block from where I'm sitting right now. And this gives a real-time measure of the, of the particle counts. This actually was for, during the time period when there was fires in the Bay Area here uh, in 2018. And my wife and I monitored this on a daily basis to determine whether or not it was safe to go outside and exercise. A very useful network that needs to be more effectively incorporated into public policy decisions. Another example of measurement monitoring that dates back a few years, but is a really remarkable example of what data does and what modeling can do to guide uh, uh, international global public policy decisions. This is work uh, done by Jim Anderson's group 
at, uh, at Harvard University where they detected the presence of CFCs in the, uh, in the Antarctic vortex and then were able to measure the CFCs as a part uh, at, and anti-correlate that with ozone measurements showing that as the, uh, as the um, chlorine levels uh, were high, the, the ozone level was, was depleted. These uh, measurements were done by flying some lasers that actually I had developed at, at uh, when I was at Spectre Physics in the nose cone of an ER2 as it flew down uh, through the southern latitudes. And what they were able to then is link the, the CFC uh, use to the ozone depletion. The uh, Montreal Protocols took place in, in 1989, and that was when the, the use of CFCs as refrigerants was uh, basically outlawed internationally. It was a global, uh, global uh, decision. And you can see that there was almost an immediate effect on the, the CFC levels in the, uh, in the Arctic region and a, and a subsequent increase in the, uh, in the ozone concentration in the Arctic level. I want to point out that one of the co-authors, and this is where I first got to meet Ron Cohen, uh, it, it is Ron Cohen, who's now at UC Berkeley. He was one of the, uh, the prime movers in the, uh, this measurement. This is, a, I like to use as a very clear indication of we, if we have basic measurement science, couple that to a model, in this case, an atmospheric chemistry model, and then interpret it so that it can guide public policy, we're able to actually change the course of anthropogenic impact on climate, uh, climate uh, on our climate. So I think we can do this with regard to climate change if we are able to deliver the science and deliver models that are useful in providing uh, the, the sort of uh, input that is needed by policymakers. Beyond the, uh, the ground-based and the uh, airplane-based data, there's also satellite data. This is the A-Train, a NASA series of satellites that measure uh, atmospheric uh, parameters. They go in global orbits and they're able to measure the, uh, what's going on on a more global basis. And this data needs to be integrated into the ground-based and airplane-based data as well. So what we have done as part of the Global Environmental Measurement Monitoring Initiative is organized what we call GEM centers. These are primarily located at universities and they involve input and collaboration with all of the stakeholders necessary to impact, to provide the data necessary and modeling necessary to government policies. So it involves the technology development, which is what the Optical Society is all about, uh, climate modeling, which is the uh, primarily uh, the uh, American Geophysical Union, international standards efforts, climate services, which interpret the data and government policy. We bring these together into the GEM centers, primarily located at universities in, in various places around the world. OSA and AGU have been involved in this. OSA from a technology development perspective, AGU from a climate modeling and measurement perspective. And the reason why this wor is working so well is the international and global reach of these two societies, which really have members all over the world. Uh, we are also working with a variety of other, uh, other agencies, IGIS, which is the Integrated Greenhouse Gas Information System, which is part of the World uh, Metrological Organization, which is part of the UN, and also with standards organizations with NIST uh, at, at, in the US and NPL in the UK. We've worked with a whole variety of different societies to organize these efforts and, and encourage input from these society, uh, from these different organizations, both within the US and outside of the US. And now we've been establishing these centers at various places around the world and have about five centers up and running in discussions with another half a dozen or so in these different geographic uh, uh, areas indicated here. Uh, we and uh, the active centers right now in Northern California are focusing on ocean chemistry, harmful algae blooms, freshwater resources, greenhouse gas emission, and air pollution and dense networks. Again, focusing on the regional issues that are associated with the uh, California area and working with the state governments to, uh, to try to provide input into policy decisions. We are also working with the COP26 uh, 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 effort in Glasgow to develop a network of centers in the city of Glasgow, and Ron will be talking more about that. With the university, the center in Scotland is at the University of Strathclyde, and they've really integrated this center into their, their whole university educational format, and they're involving the economics uh, department, law, political science, civil engineering, mathematics, and also the technical area, physical science areas as well. They've engaged heavily with the UK government. They're working on freshwater resources, North Atlantic ocean ecology and urban pollution. 
We have two, two centers that are being established in Canada. One I've mentioned is the at the University of Laval in the Sentinel North program. Southern Canada, they're focusing on, uh, on fossil fuel mining and its impact on water and air quality, as well as uh, the overall health, uh, agricultural health and arboreal forest health located there. And finally, uh, we have a center at the, uh, at the uh, University of Otago in uh, New Zealand, off, uh, focusing on very similar overlapping technology or problems uh, in terms of ocean ecology and greenhouse gas emissions. All of these centers are networked together and are sharing data and sharing initiative and perspectives on how to inter interface with the policymakers. What I wanted to um, close with was that, you know, um, climate change in the future of smart cities are not the only contemporary worldwide changing challenges facing nations today. Uh, we are in the midst, of course, of a global COVID-19 pandemic, which has many similarities to the challenges of climate change. The COVID-19, like climate change, has no respect for national boundaries. The pandemic requires coordinated evidence-based policy decision-making, which have great economic and societal impacts. And effective decision-making requires input from many science and engineering disciplines to develop innovative solutions. In a similar way to the GEM initiative, I've been working with another, uh, uh, OSA has been working with another scientific society, the, uh, the Lifebox Society. We teamed up with them uh, to uh, Lifebox assists hospitals in addressing healthcare challenges in countries with limited resources. Uh, we collaborated to develop cost-effective instruments to decontaminate N95 respirators, which could be quickly constructed by engineering teams located in these uh, limited resource settings using readily available parts. Here are some examples of some of the, of the designs that we put together. The Optical Society contacted engineering teams located near hospitals uh, in these regions and coordinated the construction of these devices that have been designed and developed by expert uh, uh, multi-site engineering teams. Uh, we network these teams to share design tips and testing results and also insights on how to deal with regulatory officials in their respective uh, regions. There are now 25 groups around the world building these devices to support healthcare professionals in roughly 40 regional hospitals in these limit, limited resource settings. I mention this as an additional illustration of the constructive roles that international soci scientific societies can provide to coordinate effective responses to global challenges, very similar to, to what's going on with climate change. In conclusion, I am looking forward to exploring with all of you in the next few days, during the next few days, how Microsoft can contribute to the future of cities and to help improve global health in general and to deal with many challenges of climate change. So with that, I'll close and be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Tom. Uh, fascinating talk, lots of data, lots of information, uh, and some good questions here to follow up. The first one comes from John Fink. Uh, John says, 25 years ago, there were unsuccessful attempts to persuade NASA to launch one or more urban-focused satellites. Given the evolution of remote sensing technology and the urban issues we're discussing this week, do you think there is a need today for such city-focused orbiting instrument packages, or are there sufficient data available from other sources? Uh, I think there is considerable data that's available with the existing satellite networks. However, of course, uh, with the given uh, the current administration, there isn't a real uh, incentive uh, from their perspective to develop and launch new technology, which might put pressure on the fossil fuel industry, to be very honest. And so, you know, the state of California is launching its own CUBE satellites to measure methane uh, and, and greenhouse gas emissions in order to provide the sort of feedback necessary to guide California policies, and they're funding this themselves. And so uh, I think that uh, right now there, uh, there probably is not sufficient uh, coverage to be able to provide the input that we need in order to be able to uh, uh, do, to guide policy. I think that the European Space Agency uh, and some of the other space agencies are continuing. Uh, the U.S. has had a slight pause here, and hopefully that will be uh, corrected uh, in next January. Great. Our next question comes from Scott Counts. Regarding increasing our environmental sensing capabilities in order to improve the models, what is your sense of the magnitude of the challenge ahead of us in terms of numbers and types of ground level sensors? Millions of sensors, billions of sensors? You know, I, I think that uh, it depends on what questions you're trying to answer. And certain areas of the country are probably not going to require 
uh, the sorts of dense networks you might want in a city environment or along the coastal regions. So I think the answer to your question depends on what specific uh, questions need to be addressed within uh, the specific regions that are, uh, are being challenged. I think you'll hear about some of the different approaches to this from uh, uh, the some of the speakers that'll be talking later in uh, uh, later in the the meeting. Uh, Jocelyn Turnbull and Ron Cohen in particular, uh, and I think they will give you an idea of what density is needed for the urban environments. Uh, for other environments, it just depends again on what the, the level of uh, what what the question is you're trying to address. In certain areas, for example, in New Zealand, they're very concerned about uh, nitrate pollution in rivers. You're probably going to want dense networks that monitor the runoff from a variety of agricultural production facilities within New Zealand, and that will require a much more dense network. And you know, at this point, uh, the cost of these sensors is too high to uh, to allow them to be deployed at sufficient density. And this is part of the challenge for uh, the engineering community is to develop cost-effective solutions, similar to what Microsoft has been working on and Ron Cohen has been working on, which uh, can be deployed to address those specific questions uh, within that are, and the densities that are required uh, for the different uh, di different environments that are gonna be placed. So it just depends on the questions and uh, and what, uh, what, the, what, the, what the policymakers are trying to address in terms of specific uh, uh, questions in, in putting policies in place. Great. The next one comes from Kristen Lauder. Kristen asks, can you talk a little bit about how the GEM network can be used to influence and impact government policy, both locally, nationally, and internationally? Well, you know, that's it's it's a matter of just making sure that these people are invited to the meetings that we've been involved with. Uh, and I, I'm pleased to see that that's happening here with the Microsoft efforts as well. Uh, we've had about a half a dozen to a dozen meetings across the world of these GEM initiatives, and we always make a point of inviting uh, as uh, speakers, uh, representatives of the governed agencies. We just had a, um, a month ago a meeting in Canada. We had all the major government agencies involved in environmental measurement monitoring spoke and, and, uh, and supported the initiatives that are going on within, the, within Canada. What we find is, in general, that these people are very willing and very interested in participating. There just hasn't been a venue for them to participate with the other stakeholders. So bringing together and building these initiatives uh, at the universities, inviting all the stakeholders is really all that's necessary. We find that, in general, there's quite a bit of enthusiasm in participating. And we feel that, again, this is the sort of network that can be built around the urban centers as we begin to make smart cities networking them in a way similar to what we're doing with the GEM initiative, I think will be extremely productive. Super. All right, our next question comes from Sifang Chen, who asks, thank you for a fascinating and informative presentation. Is there information on data density on a global level? For instance, London has high resolution spatiotemporal data for many different types of measurements on a local level, in addition to global satellite data. But most other places in the world don't have that level of data density. Would it be helpful to look at where those data gaps are and how those gaps could affect climate policy? Yeah, absolutely will. And I think uh, Jocelyn Turnbull will talk about this in terms of some of the work that's going on that's UN-based uh, associated with the IGES uh, initiative. Part of the problem is getting a common ontology, getting a common uh, ex internationally accepted measurement capability that allows this data to be consolidated and shared among the participants. Uh, and so right now we don't have really cost-effective ways to do what they've been done doing in London, in my opinion, on a global basis. And then we need to be able to bring together international standards organizations to make sure that the instrumentation that's being deployed and the data that's being collected is compatible and that we can build these into a, uh, a systematic evaluation of the different climates that the cities are located in, the different, uh, different measurement conditions under which uh, these measurements are going to be taken. This is still an active area of research, and it's one of the main focuses of the GEM initiative, is to try to provide a network uh, and support for this sort of research and the development of the, the both the measurement capabilities and of the, the software to evaluate it and uh, uh, to make sure that we can share this on a global basis. All right, uh, that concludes the question and answer portion for this talk. Thank you very much, Tom.
Uh, Janus, I believe, has some information that she'll be making available. Oh, she's just posted it. Um, if you can, if everyone could take a minute, this provides uh, some guidance on how you might want to spend the next 30 minutes uh, re-nourishing and uh, continuing to communicate with each other during the lunch break. We've got a, a lunch chat room set up for people. Uh, it also provides some guidance on uh, expectations for where you should go and what we should all be doing uh, with the second half of the workshop today. Uh, so with that, um, I will uh, close down the morning session and uh, look for everybody on the afternoon so, session. So, Roy, uh, sorry, we we're going to switch back over to me for a few for a few more announcements. Oh, Is that okay? Yes, I will hand the microphone back over to Kristen. Great. So, thank you, everyone. Thank you for a wonderful set of talks. So, I know it's hard to uh, clap in the virtual setting, but uh, let's uh, do a virtual round of applause, at least in our imagination. It was truly wonderful to hear from all of you from these different perspectives. We're looking forward to lots more wonderful talks in the next two days. Um, I also posted something in the Q&A um, that if you have if you were not speaking in the workshop, but you do have projects that are related to any of these talks and that you'd like everyone to know about, please go ahead and put those links in the Q&A. Um, this uh, Q&A chat will be available to us all afterwards, so it'll be a nice resource for everyone. Um, so I'm going to just make two more uh, remarks before we go to the um, kind of lunch break. Um, one is, so opportunistically, I'm going to respond to something that Tom Baer mentioned in his talk about some um, privacy issues um, around data that's generated for addressing all of these different problems. So I feel that I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention a major project that I lead at Microsoft Research, which is called Private AI, which allows us to use technology we've developed, homomorphic encryption, to um, secure data by encrypting it at the source and then hosting it in the cloud only in encrypted form. So only the parties who are supposed to have access to the data can do computation and AI predictions on the encrypted data and return encrypted results to the parties that are authorized to see the, uh, the content. So I thought this would be a good context to at least mention that project and that um, um, opportunity and technology. Uh, thanks, Tom, for the um, kind of call out of that issue. Um, I'll put a link in the chat and anyone is welcome to follow up with me. Um, but given that, that it's a bit orthogonal from the main theme of this uh, conference, we didn't schedule any talks on that topic. Um, OK, so switching over to the next part of our day, what I wanted to say is that um, after our lunch break, where you're welcome to join in the chat room and kind of chat with each other, it's not video, it's just it's just chat. Um, we're going to switch into our working groups, so you should all have uh, links to join um, for the working groups this afternoon. And we also have um, templates set up already for the white papers, so thank you, Janus, for setting those up. So each group will have its own shared document that we'll be collaboratively editing over the next uh, hour and a half after lunch uh, before coming back to the report out session and the, the two intern posters. Um, so just to remind you one more time, so the white papers are intended to keep the groups focused and to create some tangible outcomes from the workshop. And they will be made publicly available and everyone in the group that wants to be an author and participates will be listed as an author. So these are brainstorming sessions, so everybody's supposed to have fun, but um, please each group should have a scribe at least one scribe to be capturing the thoughts on um, real time and to help you know minimize the amount of time afterwards used to needed to finalize and um, so I just very concretely I would suggest um, brainstorming several ideas for kind of services or programs in your um, working group topic and then working through the questions on the template and kind of writing out answers to them and if each team kind of uh, envisions or describes like one to three possible solutions or services 
and um, really thoughtfully thinks about the answers to the questions on the template, I think that will really help to capture the collective knowledge that we have at this workshop. So um, I just wanted to kind of uh, provide that guidance to everyone, and I hope that you'll all have fun with your working groups and that will so we'll see you back at the report out at 1 30 where each of the five groups will give a very short report on what you've discussed uh, so far today and we'll hear uh, two intern talks so thank you very much uh, see you all on the other side